we I, I can't, when we do podcasts, you're a podcast person. You, yes, it's, uh, it's not good. But I get frustrated when someone I really love comes over and we start talking. And I'm like, save it. Save, I know. But then I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, we can always just repeat it. But we were just, we're going to jump right into a conversation about her special, which is out now yes. on Comedy Central. Yes. And I was just telling her how disgustingly jealous I am of her title because it's such a good title. This is so nice of you. Tell me about it. It's called Hot for My Name. <laughs> Get it? My name is Esther Pavitsky, and it's the <laughs> ugliest name in the world. My last name is coming, so I'm not super compassionate, but yes, I see where you're coming from. But then I was saying the title I Love You for your spe- one of your specials is so weird <laughs> because I don't really like the funny, punny titles. Like, I'm not really into that. I'm yeah. not a pun person, but just having your special be called I Love You and then the imagery that you use is so psychotic. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Winnie's crazy. That's what it is. I, that's that's what's funny about her. My She's second, insane. But yes, my second special was called "I Love You," and I wanted it to be really ominous and aggressive. And I scare every man away. Yes, totally. I was just like, I want to be alone forever. How do I figure this out? I had just gone through a really bad breakup, and I was still in the codependent place of thinking relationships ended because you loved them too much. <laughs> I used to think there was such a thing as loving someone too much and it scared them and like they couldn't handle my love when in reality that quote unquote love was just micromanaging, (laughs) martyring, controlling, trying to change them. Control is the the yuck. (laughs) Um, My love was actually like emotional abuse. Uh, And so Mm -hmm. I I wanted to make a post and I hate funny posters. Yeah. I hate funny posters. I hate silly shit. I like Mm -hmm. my first special ever. I did kind of do a funny like I think a lot of female comics like we feel like we have to be like overly sexual or something yeah. in the beginning it's yeah. before we kind of like at least me personally and uh it was called money shot which is also a great name it's, it is a great name it's not bad <laughs> it's not bad but i was like naked and i had like i was kind of awesome but like I, I was just like topless i just was like well who am I? I didn't know who i was i was like am i this person am i raunchy <laughs> like who am i like and uh, the I Love You special, the poster, I wanted to rip my chest open. So scary. In the poster. So scary. And it gives you, you nightmares. Don't Google it. Actually, it, do. <laughs> <laughs> Your algorithm will be jacked for a while. And they couldn't do it with um, special effects. So we rented a cadaver in Van Nuys and they cut the cadaver open. I'm, I'm so sick. <laughs> and they photographed it. <laughs> and then I had to pretend I was ripping my chest open and they put the photo Are you serious? of the open cadaver photoshopped it in. Yeah. How did you get this way? <laughs> How? Wait. My thing is, unless you do it right, don't do it at all. I do like that. You're I was so talk- committed. I was talking about this yesterday. I was like, I, I was hiking with my lover and I saw Christmas lights on a house that were like crooked and not done well. And I literally was like, what's the point? Like, why even bother? If this story ends with you getting on a ladder and fixing them, <laughs> I'm walking out because you're t- it's too much. I just like, do it right or don't do it at all. That's like my mentality. Okay, I have, before we even get into anything, I have an announcement for your listeners. Mm-hmm. And that is that if you're a fan of Whitney's, there's something that I know about her that you guys need to know. Whitney is the OG of skincare to the degree that you, you'll you never even understand. <laughs> 10 years ago, I would show up to the comedy store and it'd be all guys, all guys. And then there'd be one woman, Whitney Cummings, whose face was dripping wet. It was it was honestly really scary. She was it was like 11 o'clock at night. Maybe it was like 12 o'clock at night. She was just glistening oil to the point where guys would be like, what? going on like does she know and it's truly that you were ahead of the skincare curve you were just seruming and oiling and I don't know if you knew but it was you were the OG of the skincare I looked like a jellyfish at all times in my 20s um I want I always start are you okay do you need a tissue no no I'm fine I oh are you crying I, by the way, that wasn't serums. Those were tears. I was wet. I was soaking wet. Uh, me being the only woman in the comedy store in my 20s was very traumatizing. We'll get to that in a minute. But I always start the podcast with asking the guest if we're friends. Mm. I sure as hell hope so. I've 
I've been trying so hard for a decade. I am I feel like I finally arrived. <laughs> I'm you know for a yeah. fact I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> I'm obsessed with you and Chelsea and Natasha. Yes. I, the three of you, I just, I want frame photos of all of you in one room of <laughs> my house. Like, you know I, I'm obsessed with you. So if you will allow me to be your friend, yes. Well, I really want to talk about our friendship because f- f- I, it's interesting. I feel like you and I have recently trauma bonded yeah. very hard during the pandemic. I feel like this yeah. invisible murderer virus has brought us together. Correct. I when you and I first met, I was not taking on new friends. I remember. I, <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I didn't have any openings, and I was at capacity. Um, there was a waiting list. This is a story about persistence, <laughs> Rudy. Rudy. <laughs> and I think I have to be honest with you, like. For the longest time, and I and you know people have seen what's going on in the comedy world and the news and the podcast world. Like I, the environment of comedy was so toxic for so long that I think I sort of adjusted accordingly and um, put blinders on, figured out a way to go into comedy clubs, not connect with anybody, put on all my armor, and just not entrenched with anybody and just figure out a way to get in and get the fuck out which by the way is right like you had the right plan of action like i that's why i wasn't like oh you know screw her no i knew what you were about and why you were like that because look i i'm just saying i get it and i'm i'm i subscribe so i think when you started coming to the comedy show when i first started knowing you i was already it, this well-oiled machine of you get in and you do your job and you get the fuck out because- which made me love you even more <laughs> Which, the mo- <laughs> really that is called Stockholm Syndrome for everyone <laughs> listening. So I remember just going, if you stay and you hang out, you're going to be called a slut. You're going to be called a whore. You're going to be called ugly. People are going to say- Oily, wet. Oily, wet. <laughs> people are going to be jealous of your luminous opalescent skin game. I ha- You know, it's funny. People make fun of how shiny I used to be. Yes, I used to put oil all over my face all the time because I had such bad acne my whole life. A lot of people don't know I was on Accutane twice. I went on Accutane when I was 16 and when I was 21, that's how bad my cystic acne was. Are you night blind from it? <laughs> that's a real thing. Wait, what's night blind? When you can't see in the dark anymore from Accutane. Accutane is so severe. Oh, Accutane. I, is it even FDA approved? I don't I don't think I, there. You have to take birth control the same time you take Accutane and you have to get blood tests every month to prove that you're not pregnant because babies would be deformed. And it's linked to suicide. It's a link to a lot of fucked up shit. I did not know night blindness was one of them, but a lot of stuff is starting to make sense. We should turn the lights off yeah. and see if you're okay. <laughs> no, wait, I don't. I don't just go. Kidding, in, just kidding. I don't go in front of a camera without at least four giant lights around me. <laughs> um, I, but I am going to look into that because I've had a couple weird run-ins with coyotes at night that I feel like could have been prevented if I didn't take Accutane. Oh God! But what Accutane does, uh, by the way, one of the side effects of Accutane, I wrote all about this uh, in my book, is anal bleeding, mm. and I remember just being like worth it didn't deter me didn't slow me down that's how bad my acne was when i was a teenager like the really cystic deep ones that you feel and you know when you feel it that this is going to be like a three week thing this thing's going to be it's going to take about three weeks to run its course it hurts it's just dread the dread of knowing i'm going to have this volcanic eruption for the next you know, and then a scar, maybe forever. A scar, and then you're squeezed. Like I just, I think that you know, when you're a teenager, your appearance—it's good, bad, needs to be, you know, um, therapy. Who cares? The point is that that's well, this is before filters. We didn't have Nashville filter. We didn't have Hefe. We didn't have the dog ear filter. Like you looked like what you looked like. It like, was really hard. You know, you, we didn't have a, We couldn't add brightness to our photos. We you had to see each other in person and all of our imperfections. And I remember, like during lunch, I would go into the bathroom and just hide because I was so embarrassed about my skin. Ugh. And. Uh, what I learned finally after playing whack-a-mole with these really drying agents, salicylic acid, zit creams, the things that just fry your face would exacerbate it. Yep. And a dermatologist finally told me that your uh, oil production glands actually overcompensate when you dry your skin out. So the best thing you can do for oily, sk- or, uh, uh, broken out skin, even though it's a total, uh, goes against all instincts, it's a totally um, anathema to what you think you should do, you should put oil on oily skin because then your oil glands will start producing less oil. It's 
crazy. <laughs> the 90s ruined our lives, okay? <laughs> oil-free face wash. Everything we bought was oil-free. We were eating fat-free. Like, Snack wells. Fat-free cookies that actually had way more calories. Ma- than way more just, sugar. Way more sugar. It's it was We were doing it all wrong. That's and so it's true. So, it's so against... Remember like, Alestra potato chips? <laughs> that was some anal leakage right <laughs> yes. there. Vitamin D deficiencies and anal leakage. Between my Accutane and my Olestra Lay's potato chip, ship, shit, you, potato <laughs> shit, might as well. You need a diaper. Yeah. <laughs> you need diapers at all times. But so I started then dousing my face in oil at all times, and then I stopped breaking out, which I know feels so counterintuitive, really but it scary. really worked. That first time you put oil on your skin after being trained not to is scary, but that, yeah, it's crazy because your skin is so perfect now. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I feel like you're a real oil addict. Thank you. Addict. I believe strongly in, in lubing up your face. If you right now were to tell me one oil that I'd like need... Just give me one. Um, you know, well, I gave you one in your little thank you package for coming, which is a serum that I use um, that has grapeseed oil in it. I would say grapeseed and tomato seed oil are my number one oils. Okay. Yes. So number one and number one. There's a, <laughs> it's a tie. Um, tomato seed, I've never really heard talked about. I feel like you're the only one on the tomato seed oil. Because game. I don't want to tell anyone because then it'll get sold out and people will start having my secrets and oh, then no. the, it'll fuck up the bell curve. Do we need to cut this out? <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> like, I also uh, recently discovered an oil called Apara, E-P-A-R-A, black-owned. Great thing um, uh, to buy, but also just an incredible oil that I've become obsessed with. I also put different kind of oils on different parts of my face. Okay. The thicker oils go around the eye and on the eyelid. Whitney the- <laughs> always has to do it a little extra than everybody else, okay? <laughs> We will not be outdone by anyone. So I want to talk about our relationship because I think there's there's a lot to discuss. And watching your special, which, by the way, not only made me laugh and I have been dead inside (laughs) for a solid decade, made me laugh. This actually really bothers me. This is when you know someone special is funny when another comedian just gets like annoyed at it. It's just like, fuck, like. I can watch a special and normally I'll know what the punchline is going to be. I'm like, I know where it's going. I was surprised. I was dazzled. My lover was watching it. A man. (laughs) Plot twist. I know my hair is probably throwing you off with the kind of people I, what gender I date. But he was laughing so hard. He did a spit take, like a cartoon Lucille Ball spit take. And I filmed it for you. I sent it, it to you. It was so great. I, I, so here, here's, the, here's the highest praise I can give uh, Esther's comedy special. Even men think it's funny. <laughs> That's how good it is. Men even like it. <laughs> I'm as surprised as you are. That is the greatest Trust compliment. me. I literally was going to be like, I need to watch Esther's special. Can you just sit here and watch? <laughs> and he was enjoying it. He, he rewinded a couple of things. It was really funny. Did he love my dad? I feel like my dad is the star of my special. I love your dad. And I agree. <laughs> um... But I want to first say, I feel like my relationship with you is very, its and it's recently changed, but I've always felt a very protective uh, instinct towards you, but in not in a good, not in a healthy way. Oh, no, that's even better. Because I, I like that. In better. a very controlling, codependent, aggressive, you this trigger, you trigger you. me. We trigger each other. <laughs> it's all on purpose. I bring up your abandonment issues. You bring my perfectionist issues up because I was watching the special and you did this really fresh, innovative thing where you were in different outfits mm-hmm. uh, and it was over a couple nights. And remember, I was like, do not do that. Yeah. I was so angry about it. We were in the comedy store parking lot. You were stressed. She was like, I'm going to wear a couple different outfits. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I was like, no, what do you mean? Like, it made me angry. Like, I remember driving home being like, this is an irreconcilable difference. Like, we just, I couldn't understand what you were thinking. I was just like, I need to call her agent tomorrow. I need to put a stop to this. I need to stage an intervention. And it was so fun to watch. And I was wrong. No, that's, first of all, I, you, whenever someone though gives you feedback, that's not what you're expecting or you want. That's like the best person to know. Yeah. So it you, when you gave us that note, we actually like really took it in and we considered doing the same outfit twice, like, which would have helped. This is all too like inside baseball, but just know that that note, I like respected it and took it in. Yeah. And, like, almost went with it but then at the last minute I was like wait I want to wear this skirt but thank you I also wasn't sure what like she just does this really the way you know 
I think that specials now, we comedians have to evolve. You know, I cannot stand when comedians are like, why can't I say tranny? It's like, dude, is that really what's holding you back from writing a new joke? Like, you can't, is that why you have writer's block? Like, I think comedians, because we're professional complainers, that's what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. We're obsessed with injustice. Um, uh, and we don't love change in general. We're control freaks. You know, I think we have to evolve as viewers evolve. You know, there's so much content out there. You can watch a panda bear dancing to Beyonce. Like, how are you going to fucking compete with YouTube now with a stand-up special? It's you know, true. watching one person in the same outfit for an hour. It, now that I've seen your special, I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> I can't believe we were that boring for so long. That, that is how I feel. Because even like the best specials I've ever seen, like sometimes I have to pause them because I'm like, I have an Instagram brain. Like I need to just be seeing different looking things at all times. Yeah. So I did want to cut it up. And also it didn't hurt to have less time for stand-up and be able to cut to just, <laughs> just the best stuff. No, I think it was just really, it felt very, this is the oldest, most boomer shit I'll ever say. It just felt very modern to me. It just felt very like it met me at my uh, level of attention deficit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It <laughs> That's didn't, the best compliment. Yeah, I agree. Like there was no work involved. It didn't feel like homework. It didn't feel like now I have to finish this special. Like it was just, it felt like the experience of going through someone's Instagram feed. And like, now I want to go see about their family and now I want to see them in a different outfit. Now I want to see them talk about something different. Like it was really incredibly, um, you have incredible instincts. Thank you, Whitney. And I'm glad you didn't take my advice on that one, but you should take my advice about everything else. I usually do. Yeah. <laughs> I usually do exactly. Well, another thing, cause we're talking about our friendship. One of my favorite things about you is that you just kind of go with it. Like I remember last year towards the end of the year, like I had family in town. I was really stressed out and I had a set at the comedy store. And I saw you were on the lineup in a different room than me, but at the same time. And I just texted you and I was like, hey, we're on at the same time, like me an hour before. And you just wrote, why? And I was like, <laughs> so we can hang out. And then I like me expecting you to just like not reply. You're like, and then you just go, OK, see you then. See you in 15 minutes. I'm like, like, you're just down, but you don't get it. But then once you like, then you're in, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. Once I'm in, I'm in. Yeah. Once I'm in, I'm in. I'm going to be honest with you that I'm always early. So I was going to be early anyway. Mm -hmm. So that was just good to know. That was that. I do have a rule that I do no same day plans. You do really? Yes, I do no same day plans. That's a rule for me because it's hard for me to say no. Uh, uh, it's taken me a long time to be able to say no to someone, especially women. That's a whole other thing because I grew up around very sensitive women where if you stood up for yourself or said you had a need, they freaked out. So I just kind of like, or it was like, they got emotional. So I just learned do everything on their timetable. And when someone, you and Chelsea Peretti do this, because we're on a chain now, and you'll be like, what are you guys doing? Let's go for a walk in an hour. And I feel my codependents coming up being like, jump down the fireman's pole, get in the car, and like get out there to go on this walk with them, or you'll never hear from them again. I have this thing with friendships where- I relate to that. But, I feel for you on that. But I but it's really hard for me to not stick to my schedule. But if I, I make schedules for myself so that I can have pride because um, cooperation and productivity make dopamine. And during this time, so much depression stuff has come up and so much mental health stuff that I realized I just need to really schedule out my time and achieve the thing I set out to achieve or else I'll feel listless and and sloppy and crazy there's nothing i respect more than when someone sets a boundary for themselves like that it is so valuable and important um me and my college friends last year we set we made this little like 2018 rule or was it 2018 or 2019 i don't remember but it was like no flake 2019 so we set this rule where mm -hmm. it was like none of us can flake on any plans for this whole year unless you're sick or like yeah. a work emergency whatever it yeah. is in case you don't want to go yeah so <laughs> no 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 <laughs> No, for real though. And if you did, we it was like the honor system with the three of us. And if you flaked, you had to do a punishment. And Whoa. so our punishment was like, you know, if one of us lives on the east side, the other one lives on the west side, like you have to drive across town at rush hour to hang out at like a coffee shop. So it was like, there was this a- This doesn't sound like college friends. It sounds like a fight club. It <laughs> <laughs> but so we we did that for a year and it really taught me to not say yes to things that I oh. might want to not do later. I think half the time we say yes to something, it's because we know we're going to cancel or we're going to figure out, oh, I'll get out of it later. I'll just say yes now and then think of an excuse later. Exactly. So once we imp implemented that, I got so much better at like not. At, and that was a great boundary for me to learn. Like, don't say yes if you're yes. just going to flake. So boundaries for yourself. The so answer is usually no. <laughs> That's my default. The answer is usually no. And it's going to make our relationship better. Like, you know, and you're you're a tricky one for me because 
I don't really uh, romantic relationships don't um, daunt me as much because I know they're going to end like like romantic relationships. I don't men don't break my heart anymore that, that I just I've I, I have no tears left. <laughs> I have no tears left for men. But female friendships, I'm actually really trepidatious with. I get scared. I've actually probably had my heart broken the most um, by women. I know what you mean. It's like female friendships are complicated and it's like kind of our job to just like tackle them and figure them out because you can get so much out of them. Yeah. and It's so rewarding. Me and Annie Letterman actually have this like unspoken but also spoken rule where I'm but it goes both ways. We're allowed to call each other and leave literally 20 missed calls on the other person's phone. Uh -huh. And the, the other person who has the 20 missed calls is allowed to not call back for two days. Like, there's no pressure. Keeping score. There's no pressure. There's no resentment. There's no, uh, I just did this. You now need to do this. Yes. It's very, like... You know. I accept you where you are and unconditionally. Yeah. You're allowed to ignore me for... As long as you need to. I really need to rewire my brain around that because growing up around a mother that was very sensitive and very emotional, I learned that when you take care of yourself, there is a cost. And when so a woman does something nice for you, you have to reciprocate it. You have to worry about their feelings all the time, their discomfort all the time. You know, some of our most stressful relationships are with the people that are supposed to make us feel the least stressed out. Yeah. And watching your special, I learned so much more about you because I, I, I was always so confused about your personality. <laughs> I was like, I <laughs> great compliment. <laughs> well, I just was like, there's something very paradoxical about you because you do stand up, which is ostensibly one of the scariest things you can do. I think most people's biggest fear, yet you're the most fearful person I know. Yeah. And you're scared of everything. Yes. And so it's an interesting paradox. Every six months I ask you, Whitney is flying safe. You and I are so different and that, you know, and and I I think I'm too far on the other end of the spectrum. I'm scared of absolutely nothing. Wow. Because number one, I grew up in extremely dangerous circumstances all the time. And number two, I have worked really hard to realize like I just do not worry about things that I can't control. Yeah. But it's taken a long time like to rewire that. And I look at you and I'm like, I actually should move more towards Esther. Like you, no. you're very empathic and, um, I appreciate that about you. And I think, sorry, last thing I'll say is that super fearful, would you uh, describe yourself as anxious? Yes. Super fearful, super anxious people are actually, that is a huge evolutionary advantage. A thousand years ago, you would be the most successful person in the tribe. Just FYI, I just think There's we have- no way. Because right now- I'm five feet tall. I, rethink, <laughs> rethink. No, you can just sneak into caves and under rocks and very easily hide. You're perfect. You can't really reach for, you know, <laughs> lemons or oranges, but you know, that's someone else let someone else do that um no but I, I just think it's important to remember as we I think overly pathologize people who are anxious people that are fearful people that have quote irrational fears you know we were designed uh to not live in houses with alarm systems and locked doors and, and roofs right so having anxiety actually uh was a part of survival of the fittest the most anxious or the most fit the most paranoid the most hyper vigilant so I think you evolved beautifully it's just Everything else changed, so you're just you're living in the wrong time. Thank you. <laughs> Another great compliment that I will just cherish. But you are, I just want to say, you are really good at, at helping with those things because I'll be like, Whitney is flying safe. You're like, there's no articles about pilots and flight attendants like being sick from flying all yeah. the time. Like, and and I'm like, oh yeah, she's so right. <laughs> and then I go and I fly off on my tour. Like, it's just you really are very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it is my pleasure. And watching your special, you have these vignettes uh, of you and your parents. And on this show, we talk a lot about growing up in, you know, dysfunctional f homes, what happened with your primary caretaker to give you certain maladaptive behaviors. I feel like the people that listen to this show, we think a lot about, you know, what happened in our childhood to make us the uh, good and the bad of what we are today. What I we haven't really talked about on the show is the trauma of having parents who are still married. <laughs> And I think, actually, there's something really, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, frankly, dramatic about that. You know, everyone I know whose parents are married, I my instinct is, well, your parents are married. You have no problems. Like, that's really? my brain. Yeah, but that's a more immature take from maybe a couple of years ago. But now I'm kind of like, oh, my God, like married parents, like the pressure that must cause to say, what excuse do I have to not make a relationship work or... 
I don't feel that pressure. That's yeah. interesting, though. I definitely don't feel that pressure. Like, their relationship is, it's not like, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, my romantic parents and I have such a good example of love. Like, absolutely not. I don't want a relationship that's anything like theirs. They're crazy. Or you, see, or you just, but you do see people working it out. You know, you do see people with a set crystallized definition of what a relationship is. Like, because I saw so many divorces and I grew up with single people, I at least saw people try a bunch of different things and fail and go like, oh, you can fail and it's okay. And I feel like if I grew up with married parents, I'd be like, yeah, they made it work. What's my excuse? Like, even if it's not, you know, healthy, it's like you figure it out. You compromise. Relationship is a job. Like, I am always curious about what having married parents does to your psyche. Well, I mean, one thing is that, so they're a second marriage. They're okay. my mom's second marriage. Okay. And so you know, that's also at play. Like Helpful. That's yeah. helpful. Okay. Um, there's been some failure in your life. That's yes, good. There's been plenty. Yeah. You need it. Uh, people need adversity. It's so important. I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, But so there, uh, my mom's second marriage and they, there are a big age difference. Mm -hmm. My mom is 15 years younger than my dad. Mm -hmm. So I do see how that has influenced me because, you know, there's like a, something that works about that for them you know my dad's like old and defeated <laughs> so and she like does everything they're just they're not a normal example it's definitely not like like whereas my fiance his parents i feel like they're they're high school sweethearts and they're still together that i feel like that's is more sick. you're yeah that okay you're right that's the kind of thing that i'm like that is traumatic <laughs> It it's traumatic. I just feel, and maybe this is just me doing meaning making. We've talked about meaning making on the podcast. It's basically turning lemons into lemonade or whatever. Like you always want to figure out when something oh, like that. negative happens to you, the meaning make it of it. Like what am I, what's the gift of this? What's the, what's the meaning making of this? What am I learning? What am I getting out of this failure or this, this adversity? I, now that I'm older and maybe I'm just meaning making, but I'm so glad the shoe dropped early. Yeah. Otherwise, you're constantly waiting for the shoe to drop. Yeah. You know, the Damocles sword is hung. Like, I'm just, I'm I'm now, as I'm as an adult, there's sort of a relief that's like, okay, my dad already died. My mom already had a stroke. Like, all these bad things already happened. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Right. Coronavirus comes. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> let's handle this. Like, nothing. I think there is something. That's a safe place. In later in life, after you've had enough tragedy in your life, um, nothing you know you're like the worst is kind of behind me there's something that's kind of a relief about that yeah no that's cool i i feel like i i that's i like that living by that um, whereas whereas your your fiance is an anxious mess because it's his life has been too good <laughs> I know. like the worst is in front of him i'd be stressed out too i know well i feel like you'll relate to this the first time i met his parents we all went out to a nice dinner and dave was like cracking jokes and his parents we're just like laughing at everything Dave was saying. Uh -huh. And I remember sitting there like staring like, what's going on? I didn't know that your own parents could find you funny. <laughs> it was so weird. I just like was physically like, funny. where am I? Like it was so weird, the healthiness oh. and the love. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, you know, I'm now that you've seen my special, you probably can see why I felt that way. And I'm sure you probably had a similar thing because you don't seem normal. I have a hot take. I'm on your parents' <laughs> side. Uh <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, my mom thinks you're her daughter, so... You know what's so weird? When I was watching your special, I didn't even put together that your mom... Your mom and I are very close. Yeah. Would you... Is that what you would call it? She consumes everything you put out. That's... She updates me on your story. <laughs> she watches everything. My dad... I'm pretty sure my dad hates you <laughs> because my mom is always doing something about you. That's so weird. He hates all my... like. So <laughs> that's my demo. Twice married older women with comedian daughters. <laughs> so accurate. I I do I think I'm just in a place. You guys have heard me talk about this on the podcast. I am just in a place of radical forgiveness with parents because yeah. they simply did not have the tools, you know, and I think and we talk about this a lot of we forgive others not because they deserve forgiveness, but because we deserve peace. And it's just sort of like I can blame my parents all day long. I certainly can do that, but it's sort of like hasn't worked that great. And so I'm just going to radically forgive them because they didn't they didn't get what they needed either. Yeah, you I, know? I totally agree with you. And I, I it's I love to like publicly be like, it's my parents fault. You know, like yeah, yeah. they locked me in a gate and I cried. <laughs> But it, they were doing what they could. That was it. Was kind of amazing. There's this part where uh, Esther's one of her uh, teachers locked her like in a closet, and her dad's like, "How come we didn't do that?" Like it was just so like 
it also I, I maybe I have Stockholm syndrome and I'm kind of like yeah like it's only in the last like 10 years that we started thinking children should be protected from anything I mean it is a very new we used to it's just so we kids used to work in factories like no the, it's very new yeah. that we think children are valuable on any level uh, yes you know it's weird yeah you know so I feel I just watched your dad and I was like yeah I feel like in his day that's actually pretty humane, humane. closets are safe <laughs> Yeah, you know they're no safe one, in there. You know they're safe in there. No one's going to get in there. They can take a nap. Like, it's, everything's soft. It's all closed. Like, you know, like, I sort of, I, I, I appreciated that. But I also saw where you got, you know, your wit. And, and I think that a lot of becoming funny is having to defend yourself as a kid. Like, yeah. full stop, you yeah. know? Like, people are always like, oh, my God, having the name Cummings, like, that must be a nightmare. I'm like, yeah, but it also made me have to, I got bullied so much as a kid about it that I had to get quick and I had to learn how to throw insults back. That has to be a huge reason why you're a comedian. Do you feel like that? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think, I think in terms of having to defend myself and having to, I think a lot of comedians, you know, who was it that said the definition of, uh, or stand-up comedy, we do it so that um, we can uh, insult ourselves. We we can control the way we're embarrassed. Yeah. We embarrass ourselves before you can do it. That is so correct. I always say, like, I can't be embarrassed. Like, I... No, I will be. I know I'm going to be embarrassed here. Let me just let me handle it so that you guys don't do it and ambush me or or sidetrack. Like I want to know and yes. control how I'm going to be embarrassed. So relatable. I really love that. I kind of feel like you've gotten a little bit fucked over in a way where you were like the feminist kind of before feminism was like cool and you were the star the creator and star of an NBC sitcom mm -hmm. and people made fun of you online. Yeah. And that's kind of like the worst fear. Yeah. And you've come from that. You've come through that. You're I was still canceled successful. before cancel culture even happened. But you were like, <laughs> but it was like not for doing something wrong. Yeah. People yeah. made fun of you. Yeah. And that was really fucked up. And I, yeah. it was sexism. That was yeah. like pure. I that mean, was there it. was, if you go back at the reviews of the NBC show I did, it's, there's comments literally about my appearance. I mean, there's literally of like, she's, got the fucking she's wiry, head. she's willowy. Like, I mean, it's, they're, ab they're talking about my appearance in the reviews that uh, a couple of reviews call me shrill. Like it is so wild. It's really like, you really went through that. And I feel like I don't know. I feel like you got it the like almost like the worst. Like you were like, mm -hmm. I'm a fucking woman. I'm a creator. I'm funny. And then literally reviewers berated your women, appearance. female viewers as well. I mean, Emily Nussbaum just going for it. I mean, her review was wild, like just mean. And I and I think I look now back now and I'm like, I think I I, I as someone that goes for, always for forgiveness, if I can, I yeah. went through all the pain of that. I went through the embarrassment and the shame and the sadness kind of later. I, I, I had a little delay of processing it. I think that I, I blocked it out kind of when it was happening because it was number one. My mom had just had a stroke. I had another family member who was super sick. My dad had a stroke. The universe kind of colluded to distract me from that with like other tragedies that put everything in perspective about like a bad review, yeah. you know. Um, but I, you know, I look back at that and I was like, God, I guess I really trigger people. I, I feel like we've yeah. said that word a lot on the podcast. Like I understand like a loud woman, but you know, that, that doesn't want to get married. That's what the show was about. It was about, uh, it was a gender reversal. I wanted to do a very traditional classic sitcom where the man had the qualities of, of stereotypical woman and the woman had the qualities of a man. No, I remember. I watched the show. I did watch it illegally because I didn't have cable. That was like back when I knew how to watch shows illegally. I watched every episode. I thought it was Aww. so funny and awesome. And it actually really sucked, like not to make this about me, but I'm not going to, like it sucked that I looked up to this person and watched your show and then saw like all these m shitty people yeah. making fun of it and I didn't know why. Yeah. And I just feel like, how do you get through? Like, I'm like, how could anyone survive that? But then here you are like literally thriving, created a successful show. Like you've done so much since. And I just want to like acknowledge that that was fucked up and it's weird and it doesn't like, there needs to be like a renaissance about it. Like, wait, we all need to apologize. 
That was wild. That's so interesting that you're bringing this up. And like, I'm sorry. Like, I feel like it could be even triggering to bring up and like, you cut no, this I'm out. No, I'm so glad. No, I'm so glad you're, I, it's not something I can bring up. But as I look back, like, if you were, uh, please rehash these reviews. You know, I, I think for me, you know, I know why a lot of people didn't like it because it was on NBC and it was a multicam. And this is getting into the granular of the difference yeah. between TV shows. Anyone listening knows the difference between a multicam and a single cam. Multicam, Seinfeld, Friends. Laugh audience. Big, laughing. there's a live studio audience, right? And then a single cam is like the office, Parks and Rec community. I was in the block of Parks and Rec community the office and then a multicam show you know where there's like a live studio audience like it was right. just like all the comedy nerds right weren't gonna have watching it. these shows that were more like subtle performances and way drier like that was starting to become a little more in vogue you know a little um uh the lighting is bleaker and drab like the office was obviously you know really popular 30 rock like that those are single camera shows the show should have been on like cbs yeah. You know, yeah. with like Mike and Molly, two and a half men, like like Big Bang Theory, multicams. Like it would have, I think, fit better. Yeah. But there was a very malicious um energy that 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 came at me. Like people would say, like, it's a laugh track. I would even say to the journalists, I was like, Do you want to come see the people in the audience? Like it's like, you, you know, we had to take microphones out of the audience. Like it no one wanted uh to like it. You yeah. know, it, it, it was it was I mean, even writers like big, big writers who one one of whom has since apologized to me, I think it was like a year ago. I mean, Hollywood writers would like tweet like really malicious shit about it, um, which that doesn't happen right now. Like people don't do that. You anymore. can't do that. Like if a if a if 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 a TV show with um, starring a woman came out, no one could just tweet about it and trash like, it. Fuck her. She's whatever. No ugly. one could. You could not do that. You know, and uh, one of them recently apologized to me. Actually, it, it was actually really wild because a lot of people I looked up to and really admired and liked um, uh, trashed me like on Twitter, like as if I like wouldn't see it or something. And um, one of them apologized to me recently and was like, uh, yeah, I was, you know, and this is what he said. So it is what it is. But he was like, yeah, I was just so jealous that you got something at 27 years old and you had this show. And it also got... It was ubiquitous. It also got because plot twist. I test very well. <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand that if a show gets a lot of promotion, it means it did well in the testing, <laughs> right? And Chris D'Elia was on the show. It was fucking hysterical. And we had great chemistry, which is kind of the whole sort of like in that tested very highly. So they ended up giving us a lot of promotion. And anyone that's like all over fucking the sides of buildings, I, I feel like... If I was a comic and saw a show that was called like Amanda and it was like a like a girl that was like holding a beach ball sassy, I would probably make fun of it too, you know? Like But but I feel like we're learning and I hope everyone is on board with this that like not everything is for you. So if yeah. you see Amanda and the beach ball, like yeah. maybe it's not for you, but it's for someone. Yeah. And you're like yucking someone's yum. Yeah. And I just think it's I don't know, I just don't wanna I get it. We all want to make fun of stuff. It's fun. But I do think a weird, very, like, I feel like very sexist reaction filled with jealousy happened to you. And, like, you've come through it. You didn't, like, quit the business and, like, move to Wichita. And, yeah. like, that's impressive to me. I never really, it's weird. I don't think I've ever gotten over it. You know, I think it was, it was a kind of trauma a kind of emotional trauma where I feel like I, I, which is also weird because the show does really well in other countries. Like people also like love it. It's I can't stress this enough. <laughs> Watched every episode. I'm waiting for it to like come out somewhere. It's legal. on the Peacock. Oh, it is. It just came on the Peacock okay. streamer. I need to get Peacock. Yeah, people like, it's weird. People do love it because I really wanted to make a show, God, it's so, it was long ago, but that was uh, universal, you know, like so many, I mean, literally we shot at Universal, but uh, <laughs> uh, there were a lot of shows on about very specific, like I love The Office, but it was about a very specific American sense of humor. You know, they had their their award thing at Chili's. You know, it's, it's sort of like everything was specific American comedy community, very specific. I wanted to do something that was like, if you don't, 
even if this could air in any country, it's about like, why did your ex just text you? Mm -hmm. Anyone, any culture, any creed, anyone in any part of the world can relate to that fight. That yeah. is a universal fight that transcends, I think, culture, religion, so many things, you yeah. know? And I really wanted to make that show about little tiny things. Like there was an episode, I fucking love this episode, where uh, the uh, my boyfriend character shushes me. And that's it. That's the whole up. That's the whole. That's the beginning of the whole episode. It's just shh. and that <laughs> exactly. Whereas so many shows now are like, and he's dead the whole time, <laughs> and it's secretly a vampire. <laughs> like everything's so fucking complicated. Whereas the reality is, the most of our real estate come and that that's taken up is like, why are you having lunch with your ex? Like that's what most of us have to do. That deal sounds with. fucking interesting. That to me is is an episode. I mean, there was an episode with June Raphael who played the ex, which was why do you have a box of your ex's stuff? It was like a box of her stuff. Oh, you I know? know someone that has that that yeah, that's I know that that's real. <laughs> I love that shit. Like yeah. that's the kind of shit I love. Like there was a whole episode about, you know, we've talked about it on this show of um I wash my boyfriend's jeans and he gets really upset because you're not supposed to wash jeans. Guys don't wash their jeans. <laughs> so weird. It's weird. Dave never lets me wash his pants. No, you're not allowed to wash. Guys don't wash their jeans. It's weird. I need to just it's override why, that. That's and... why we have a coronavirus. I'm telling you. <laughs> I That is the real origin of it. But yeah, no, I... I the last thing I want to say about Whitney, even though I just cut you off and it's your show. No, please. Is I'm the episode where you like accidentally blurt out the phrase Uber Cray Cray. Oh, Do you know God. what I'm talking about? Um, I blurted it out. Okay, yes. Uber Cray Cray. Yes. It's so Dumb. stupid and so funny. And I say it all the time still eight years <laughs> later. It's so good. It's so weird. I should have known there that you were so weird. But I just want to like give that show like a solid shout out and moment that it mm -hmm. is so good yeah and that it like blows my mind that more people aren't like wait we like were fucked up about this thing and it yeah. was a woman getting her shot and we like ruined it a little bit i mean they didn't ruin it because you made so many episodes of it but like well that's the other thing i think we made we made two seasons and i remember this because like i would have journalists interview me and now i look back and i'm like oh my god they were being so shitty to me and i was too naive and young to know. I assumed if a journalist was interviewing you for an article, like they liked you. Uh huh. Like that's such a. I. I. I like, and they were just gonna write you the way you meant to sound. Like they would write me as the person I am, which is you know, or something. And they don't have vendettas or agendas or you know. There was this guy. Um, I can't even remember his fucking name, but he, he got fired over the interview. Um, what? Because what was David Goldman? I think his name is. Can you Google? Uh, I don't give a fuck. Uh, he interviewed, like, literally, I remember waking up at, like, 6 a.m. And he's like, hey, I've never heard of you, but my wife really likes you. And I remember being like, okay. Like, I just was, like, still programmed to laugh at any, right. You're like, <laughs> any joke a man says. I'm like, oh, oh, my God. Like, you don't know me. I'm just going to try harder to get your approval. And he said something. He's like, He said something about me. Like, he was like, on the roast, someone made a joke about you sleeping your way to the top. Is that true? You yeah, know. that's true. Here's all the guys I fucked. Yeah, like, because yeah. fucking guys just, like, print scripts that <laughs> need to be shot. Like, as if that's ever worked. David Goldman, he was at The New Yorker, I think. I've learned that if someone is interviewing them, it's, like, I need to kind of get clarity on what the article is about because I recently did an interview and they made the article kind of about what they wanted it to be about and not about what made sense for me. So I will just say that that's a real thing. Andrew Goldman. Um, I was just filling time while you were looking that up. Thank so you. You don't have to respond. Thank you. Um, this bitch holds a grudge. <laughs> and yeah, I just, I had no idea that someone would want to embarrass someone else or, you know, I, I, I just, I don't think I realized like, Female comics are the most hated people on the planet. A little bit. We are hated, you know, and that is, and anyone listening to this show, listening to female comics talk, obviously you're not, you know, but we are very triggering to people. And there is, um, and I don't know if it's because there's this subconscious, like they're signing up to be rejected, like they're putting themselves out there to be critiqued or whatever, but there is a very real vitriol around a woman that is fucking speaking for an hour 
and no one else gets to interrupt. I mean, there is a like a fucking who do you think you are? I need to tear you down to size. Yeah. I feel like that's what was happening to me. Yeah. I feel like when I did a, a sitcom and had a I had two shows at once, two broke girl. This is before when you had to be apologetic and small and minimize yourself. And if you were successful, you were like a, you know, uh, I think there was a how dare you? Mm-hmm. Who do you think you are? And you don't deserve it. You don't get to win like this. Yeah. Not on my watch. Yeah. And everyone decided they were going to make a sort of um, like a Salem witch try. It felt very much like a we need to make an example out of her. That that's how women too, by the way. I'm this is not No, I know. This is like women fucking came for me. And, you know, it's 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 tricky. And I I do think I sort of learned to sort of go numb a little bit about yeah. that because I was just like, okay, like the price of what I do is there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna have some irrational hate for me. And that's just part of this. Like I get to pay my bills and I get to have health insurance. Like that's just the price I pay. Like I sort of, that's how the meaning making of how I've kind of rationalized it. That's unfortunate. I wasn't taught you could have it all. Like yeah. <laughs> this next generation, yeah, no, <laughs> they could have it all. I never, thank God, I was <laughs> drilled into my head by my dad. Life is not fair. <laughs> so I didn't think I deserved more. I was just like, okay, well, If my bills are getting paid, like, you know, this is a small price to pay. But, you know, there is a I think it's interesting for us to all look at our internalized misogyny about a woman, you know, how triggering it is when women get successful. I do it, too. I have it, too. I have it. it. I have it. (laughs) I have it. I I, (laughs) like I'm furious about your special. That is so good. (laughs) Like, frankly, I hope there's a campaign to tear you down. Uh, And, um, you know, but. You know, it, it is interesting, but there's also there's almost like an immersion therapy. Is that what it's called? Exposure therapy of Exposure like therapy. how my worst nightmare is having people hate me. And it, ha- yeah. and it just happens. That's why I'm so interested. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? There's not there's a certain freedom in having everyone uh uh, having that, which by the way, Twitter is not everyone. That's the other thing. Yeah. Twitter is not everyone. The majority of like America really liked it and thought it was good. Like this was just on Twitter. We have to remember Twitter is not real life. 20% of people are on Twitter of that 2% generate 80% of the comments. Like I need to repeat that statistic to myself a I lot. I really like when you say that. <laughs> yeah, I say it a lot. I I'm, really love it. I'm a broken record with that one. Um, and it was kind of as someone who was so programmed to be loved, that's all I ever wanted was for people to like me, for people to love me, uh, to contort, shapeshift, to try to make people laugh. And having this sort of mass uh, backlash it, that kind of couldn't have been worse. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. it kind of couldn't have been. And I don't even know all of it because I was, no, I don't, you know. I don't have anything you don't I, know. I didn't know. I remember I was working on the show and again, my mom had a stroke. So I wasn't Googling myself. I wasn't on Twitter. Like I was like in an ICU writing the first season of that show. And I remember going to like an NBC party, like for upfronts, like the first thing I had like went out to do that was like, I'm promoting a show. And I like put on a dress that like, like an old dress from like Delia's or something. Like I didn't have like stylists. Like I didn't have any, you know, it was before I had like the checks had started clearing or anything. And I went to a public space and everyone was coming up to me like, how you doing? You okay? You hanging in there? Like people would, everyone, like as if I had like a terminal illness, people were like, they're just jealous. Don't you, don't, you know, what? everyone hated Seinfeld the first season. Like people were just consoling me and I didn't know what they were talking about. I thought they were talking about the fact that my mom had just had a stroke and I was like, oh, she's going to be okay. And they're like, what? Like, I didn't know about it. I think thankfully. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I I do think um, it left a mark uh, in a way that has definitely made me, I think I'm a pretty reclusive person and I, um, you know, always assume people are talking shit about me, which is part of the reason I have a lot of distrust yeah. for other, co- I feel, I assume everyone's being fake with me and disingenuous because that was a time where everyone was being nice to my face, but I feel like shitting on me behind my back. Yeah. And, you know, during the whole, you know, Chris D'Elia nightmare as of recently, just so all y'all, I know everyone who's tried to say I knew. I know your names, and I just want you to know that the people that you think you're confiding in, they're more loyal to me than you. 
FYI. Well, it is, isn't that, that's like another like weird public reaction that, or like whatever it is, public shamey kind of reaction where it's like, they knew, that person knew. But yeah. it's like, how, why are you, you don't know that. You're just like creating drama because it's fun. Can I ask you a question about this? Like, yeah. I think that people that are in male dominated businesses, women especially, like, you know, number one, men don't show us their untoward behavior. No. <laughs> We're, you know, but at the same time, I do think we see a side of men that is slightly discouraging. I think it's taken me a long time to realize, like, you know, because all my friends are male comics. And then when I'm with someone who's not a male comic, I'm like, so how many porn stars do you follow? And they're like, what? Why do you follow <laughs> porn stars? And I'm like, oh, like my bar's on the floor. Do you think that being in a toxic environment has affected the way that you view yeah. Men? Like, has it done a number? Well, I wouldn't say it's done a number. Or women, frankly. But I will say, like, it's been interesting having close relationships with men over the years, close friendships. And you do, like, end up talking about dating and stuff. And I, like, just feel like I know certain things that the way guys see girls. And it's kind of upsetting. But it's also, like, similar to, like, oh, well, at least now I know, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Yeah. So now I know that whatever you guys think this about us, yeah. whatever it is. And I kind of try to use it in my toolkit as, like, a strength. Yeah. But, but I know what you mean. And it is, yeah, we, like, see guys hitting on girls all the time. But that also, it doesn't mean that, like, we're... The truth is, and this is almost going to sound like I'm, I don't know how this is going to sound, but like, we're I'll not, you know. we're not, like, you're not in the club. Like, we're not yeah. in the club. Like, I know yeah. people think we are, and we are in, we are in a club. Yeah. But like, the cool guys, they're awesome, and I love them, but there's a certain way that they're never going to see me, and there's a certain way that they're never going to see other people, uh, people of color, Gay people are like they're never going to be equal with like the top tier white men. And yeah. like you don't know their secrets. I don't know their secrets. And that's I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm saying misspeaking and saying wrong shit. But that's just kind of how I feel like I know I'm very lucky and I've been accepted in many ways mm -hmm. because of my like white privilege. And I'll say it. I'm gorgeous. Um, <laughs> yes. But like, I'm just kind of saying that like for the people that maybe think that like you're best friends with these people and they tell you their secrets mm -hmm. like they don't. Yeah. And you're not. I think it's interesting because as we were talking earlier, I'm just fascinated by this and I'm never going to stop talking to you. Um, <laughs> is that this this superficial sense of closeness, you know, is like just because sort of you and I becoming close recently has become very real. And I think that you know, sometimes we get these trauma bonds with people and these like art. I think it's happening a lot. You know, like don't mistake a trauma bond for love. Don't yeah, I don't love that. Yeah, I, I've seen that happen. And yeah. Yeah. Don't mistake love and pity. Don't mistake, you know, having a rough day with someone else on the job as like you guys should are friends or close. Like we've kind right. of talked about that. And I think that's a lot of what our you know, relationships are like with uh, other comedians, you know, is that like we know each other really well because we have the same job, but I don't know anything about you. Right. I don't know what you do when you wake up. And you kind of have to be nice to me. Like, yeah. I <laughs> like I realized that recently I was just sort of like, everybody's so nice to me because after sort of this, um, a lot of stuff has been coming to light in the comedy community. A lot of people sort of are like, how could you not know all this? And I'm like, I guess people pretend in front of me <laughs> it's like Benton was like you realize you never see how these people actually act right like they act totally different in front of you and there's yeah. something kind of weird about uh, realizing that um it's hard to it's hard to come to terms with the fact that people have secrets and I think you know anyone that listening is listening to this podcast is committed to edifying themselves in some way but not everyone else is. Like, not everyone is doing the work we're doing. Not everyone is on a daily basis going, like, how can I be better? Like, how can I be more honest? How can I be, you know, more authentic? How can I, you know, be less jealous? How can I be, you know, like, most people yeah. are A lot of people are just going through life unconscious, like zombies, yeah. just sort of getting their primal carnal needs met. Like, you know, and I think that that I feel really grateful that I have people in my life that are like really consciously trying to deprogram. But Go I think their shit. a lot of people just are not. Yeah. And that's so hard for me to believe. And that's such a fucked up. Like every time I meet someone, I just assume like <laughs> that 
<laughs> they've read every self-help book I've read <laughs> and I've been to therapy for 10 years and are like going to a 12-step program, you know, and I'm just sort of like, did you just lie to me? <laughs> like it's so, when someone lies, I mean, lie still. Yeah. Like what? I like that. We, I thought we all stopped lying. Lying is like the slap bracelet of you know, character defects. Like, that's so 90s. Like, who lies? Like, I used to lie so much, and it's just like, it's a full-time job. Lying, you have to, like, deprogram numbers. You have to to be organized. You have to be so organized. (laughs) You have to remember your lines. You have to be off book. Like, lying is, like, exhausting. So, and I also know now that, like, when you lie, you feel worse. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's, right, we're only as sick as the secrets we keep. So it's, like, then you feel shame. And then when you lie to someone, this is the most fucked up part about lying, you lose respect for them. Yeah. Because you're, like, you believed that you're lie. Stupid, oh, yeah. you're such a fucking, like, dumbass. Like, how did I, how did I just pull that off? And then you lose respect for them. You know, I, one of my favorite things to do is to admit that you lied, like, in the- <laughs> when you just said you respected the way I dress and then you're like <laughs> I lied I love just like admitting that you just lied like I that is it, there's something cute about it it's so <laughs> funny when you catch yourself lying and you're like what was that? I'm sorry like Dave was- does that a lot <laughs> Dave does that all the time I'll ask him something and he'll answer and I'm like you made that up and don't know he's like yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> I hate this. I trust you went to Harvard. I trust you. Or like, yeah, when I, I I catch myself making up fake statistics a lot too. I'll just be like, look, 80% of people are never gonna <laughs> And Ben will be like, where what where did you what what poll was that? I'm like, I don't know. I just like felt right. Like it just felt. But no, I was um uh <laughs> I was with my lover and I have these ducks that keep landing in the pool. And I saw the ducks like earlier in the day and he was in the kitchen it was like six and I had seen the ducks at like noon and he was in the kitchen and I was like, oh, the ducks were just outside. And he was like, oh, well, I just let the dogs out. Should I bring them back in? And I was like, well, no, I mean, I actually saw them at like noon, but I just, I, I just wanted, I I just wanted you to think they were just there. I guess. Like, I don't know. It was just a weird lie. Like a toddler. I know. Like, like what? <laughs> he was just like, so the ducks weren't just there. And I was like, I guess I was trying to impress you. Like, I don't know what that was. Like, that was so weird. Like, I just... <laughs> wanted you to think I had ducks like just now. like it was just such an like when you catch yourself doing like codependent people please yeah and you're like oh that was gross but it's cool to be self-aware and like try to just be better taking a little break here to talk about italic I'm not gonna look at the copy like these other podcasters that you listen to that just half-heartedly read like robots I would like to tell you about Italic. You can tell they're reading it for the first time. You know a lot about robots, too. (laughs) I do know a lot about robots, having been one for 37 years. But Italic, I'm obsessed with this company. And if you're listening on audio and not on YouTube, you're really missing out because I'm holding up this bag that I got from Italic. How pretty is this? It's like a, it's almost like an oxblood color. Is that what you would call it? They're really nice quality goods i mean i have a backpack that i got from them oh nice stunning what does it look like it's like a a a leather and it's black and it has like these gold it almost like this purse with a backpack like this purse like and the whole deal with italics is they you don't have to pay for their advertising like will you read the copy because we do need to explain we have to explain what the product is at some point but you are paying sane prices i i refuse to pay five thousand dollars for a purse, yeah. you know me. I know I won't do it. You won't. Italic is how I fake it till I make it. Yeah, but you've seen my closet. How many purses do I have? Three. Like truly, <laughs> I will not buy new purses because they're all for some reason like seven thousand dollars. I shan't. Not, shan't. Italic won't. is a membership that grants access to over eight hundred plus quality goods made by the same manufacturers as top brands, but sold at cost. Meaning so you're not paying to put the little symbols on it that you sheeple. <laughs> they're sixty percent lower prices than leading brands. They basically cut out the Six, middle. Wait, hold on. You're blowing past the the sixty percent lower prices. You're just blow past that number. I mean, I'm just reading the coffee. It's over half. It's the same product, but sixty percent cheaper. What are we doing? Why would you ever buy non-italic products? Listen, they have- you know me. Nothing I hate more than being scammed. Than a, you know, nothing I hate more than a racket. And everything is a racket, except for italic. Excuse me, I need to now finish putting the strap on my beautiful new 
purse that you're going to use because you got one. It's I know. Cute. I'm so into this. They have lots of stuff for both men and women from luxury handbags, cashmere sweaters, activewear, bedding, bath towels, cookware, Ooh, and even I need cookware. diamond jewelry. I need the cookware. Do you remember the diamond jewelry? And I need the diamond jewelry, let's be honest. From the best possible manufacturers in each category. Be smart. Don't pay $1,000 for just a logo. Don't be sheeple. And save your money for more important things. Look how cute. If you're watching on YouTube, look at my cute new purse. And if you're not watching on YouTube, it's cute. There's currently a wait list to join Italic. But they're what? offering But they're offering our listeners to skip the wait and join immediately when you sign up through this link. Italic.com slash Whitney. Sign up for the membership now and get access to all of Italic's high quality, beautifully designed products to improve your closet, home, kitchen, and more. And never pay for markups again. Wait, hold on. Keep this in. Do not cut this out. Sheets from the same manufacturer as St. Regis and the Four Seasons. Why don't I have that? Leather bags by the same manufacturer as Celine and Prada and even a candle from the same scent supplier as La Laba, which is my favorite candle maker, and it's like 160 bucks. Yeah. Will you get me that? <laughs> <laughs> we sure will. We'll okay. sign up now okay. at italic.com slash Whitney. Italic.com slash Whitney. If you're not listening on YouTube, watch on YouTube to see how cute this purse is that I got from Italic because I'm not a huckster. Taylor Tomlinson and I are writing something together. So I'm in full writing mode. So I've been ordering from DoorDash truly twice a day. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Two of my best friends uh, work for DoorDash currently. Um, uh, one of the delivery people just got a a blue German Shepherd dog, half blue pit, half German Shepherd. I've seen pictures. That's how often I'm ordering from DoorDash. <laughs> I know the delivery people. I am obsessed because they have they have every restaurant that I like. I don't know if that's like they're targeting me or something or if they just have the best restaurant. Yeah, I think they built the app just for you, actually. The whole app was built for me and mine. Yeah. I knew it. I knew this was custom designed for me. Mm -hmm. um, I also love DoorDash and we'll get into the actual logistics about DoorDash in a second. These are just my initial thoughts from actually using the product. I also love that when it updates you on your order being made and delivered, it's always exactly right. It's yeah. like your order's eight minutes away, it's seven minutes away, instead of saying eight minutes away, and it's another hour, and that's my childhood all over again. Yeah, they're not joking. That's me not being picked up from school by my dad. It's like, they tell you when it's coming, they tell you when it's ordered. They're, I've not had one, like, rigmarole moment with, like, where's my gut person, and where's the food, and this is the wrong food. I have never from DoorDash not gotten exactly what I ordered. Like, before DoorDash, I feel like you would get like half of what you ordered. Yeah, like, this is close enough. With, to what it you was want. like it was like getting cable installed. It was like a four-hour window. Like you might get your food like <laughs> thrown over the vents at some point. You know, like it's true. Just all wet for no reason. Like DoorDash, they they keep it tight. They keep they run a tight ship. Yeah, I ordered two steaks and they got here prestigious. By the way, I. <laughs> I look over there and I'm like, Benton, what did you order from DoorDash? You just went two steaks. So also, <laughs> no one is judgmental here at DoorDash. <laughs> nope. <laughs> they don't assume your order uh, was a mistake if you order something crazy. They're not like, you sure? Did you mean? Yeah, they're not Google. <laughs> Many of your favorite local restaurants are still open for delivery. Open the DoorDash app, select your favorite local restaurant, and your food will be left at your door safely. Um, it's a crazy time for restaurants right now, obviously struggling for business, so it's also a good thing to do to order safely from your local restaurants. DoorDash deliveries are now contactless. They keep communities we operate in safe. But also, by the way, they don't leave them in some crazy place. No. They don't leave them in some, like, bird's nest or tree they leave it right where you can actually see yeah it. they take a picture they show it to you it's yeah it's a whole thing it's not like they just sort of generally throw it in your direction it's like in the bushes <laughs> yeah uh right now our listeners can get five dollars off their first order of fifteen dollars or more zero delivery fees for their first month when you download the doordash app enter the code whitney by the way this isn't in the copy but it's also not just restaurants it's like it's it's like um coffees uh places and starbucks places and i, I don't know coffee why. places and starbucks <laughs> places multiple cafes can you believe i'm just saying you can like order you know uh, if you get thirsty they'll also bring you drinks they do you can just order like a round of coffee like <laughs> I, just steak we, we had eaten so much and we were just like we just want like a coffee refresh and we ordered three coffees from a coffee place with a couple little pastries and scones it was like such a i don't know that's $5 off your first order and zero delivery fees for a month. When you download the DoorDash app in the App Store, enter the code Whitney. Don't forget that's code Whitney for $5 off your first order with DoorDash. DoorDash. And such a great alliteration. DoorDash. 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 And so how did you, when you and I, when you started in the comedy store, I think I don't 
I wasn't there all the time. Like I, I you were very in and out. You were on your path. Yeah. Like I was and and by that time I just had learned in a very male dominated business to just get in and do my thing and get out. So I didn't get accused of dating or sleeping my way to whatever I had. You know, I just realized the only way to not get accused of sleeping with people for jobs is to just be gone. Well, yeah. And also like sometimes you just exist in a male dominated space and then it's like you're just standing there and someone's like they're flirting. You're Always. Like, you're like, I was just standing. There. I know. I, and and I think there's something really interesting about about you because you're a little after me. Right. Yeah. And my sort of generation of female comics, it was very um, competitive, not because I think you have to be competitive to be a female comic. You have to sort of have a, you know, um, that hustle. Ki- that kind of hustle. You have to have that warrior spirit. But there was such a scarcity complex because there were so few spots, yeah. you know, that even if we liked each other, we still had to compete with each other because it was sort of the way they used to put comedians on lineups was like, oh, we have our female. We're good. One girl. One girl. Yeah. Out of maybe 30 comics. Right. It's just so shitty. And I do feel like it did get it got like better and better as time went on. So it's like I know how it was for me and I know it must have been worse for you. Yeah. And it was like it was just like one girl. That was it. And so we were all kind of vying for that one spot so it was always so tragic to me that like in any anyone listening that's in you know a male dominated business like the way you're kind of like forced to compete with people that you actually are the only people you really have anything in common with it's like we should be so we're probably soulmates yeah but we're being forced to kind of hate each other and uh and then you know I feel like as you know, time went on when there was even more spots, there became more comedians. So that scarcity complex um, uh, continued. Also, this is something that happens from women too. I'm not, men don't only do this, but both men and women, I think in positions of power, also pit women against each other in a way that for them might even be subconscious. But when I would come in the comedy store, any comedy club, it would be like, so-and-so, this female comic came in, she wasn't very good. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me if a male comic didn't do well? Mm. Like, why? Oh, like, it's just this subtle pitting women against each other that I didn't fully understand until later. Like, so and so, this girl asked to go ahead of you, or this person wants to change, or she's running late, and you know, she probably just wants to make sure she goes after you so that you're ahead of her. Like, just little things where I felt like the men or women in power, the fucking old people, quite frankly, uh, would sort of get off on thinking or, or they already had in their head that women are catty and don't like each other because that's yeah. everyone's that's everyone's kind of baseline idea of- I forgot about that you're right it's like oh women are yeah exactly women are catty you know how they are you know how they are like you guys all hate each other right yeah. so it was like I was already walking into that paradigm and that's a really great way to control people is to divide them you know and I think that the kind of people that work in our business are fucking adrenaline drama addicts anyway and like <laughs> fucking you know everyone's doing- present yeah 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 <laughs> here (laughs) and they'd pit us against each other in a way that I now feel like when female comics or friends or any women in male dominated businesses are friends it's kind of an act of resistance you know and I think they don't like it you know when I'm like talking to a female comic in you know uh one of the comedy clubs and people walk by they're like what are they up to (laughs) like it's collusion I know like (laughs) they're casting a spell a little coven over there like so I do think that there you know is a fear of women getting close because if we actually just you know like we're able to be in a situation conducive to getting along you know uh you know really good things could happen but I feel like there's so many forces at play keeping us yeah like not liking each other I agree and I I'm like I'm here for the change that we're like experiencing and seeing and like it's also funny that whenever I have a female comedian on the show people like you're so supportive of women this is amazing I'm like no, she's my friend. Like, I'm not supporting women right now. Like, I'm having a funny person on that I genuinely like who's special is great. Like, this isn't like an act of charity. Like, there's also that. You get like... <laughs> no, it is. But you get like... I an- feel like I won a contest. <laughs> It's <laughs> definitely my vibe right now. You gave me this hoodie. It's, you got the golden ticket. This hoodie, I'm like literally like this to it. I am so happy. I call my parents on the way here. They're like, we can't believe it. You won. Also, tell me about your engagement. How long has it been? Oh, my God. Why? I have questions. I have I, so many questions for you because I think it is so interesting that you've been in such a long relationship. I agree. I look at someone who's been in a long relationship like a fucking... Um, Remember those things, oh, copies, half giraffe, half zebras? 
You guys remember that animal? No. It was called an okapi. It was like a, a remix of two wild animals. A that, remix. A re <laughs> this is the only. This is a thing that you're the only one in the room who knows it for sure. I <laughs> look up okapi. It's an okapi. It's like a, a like a centaur kind of. I look at people that are in long relationships, and I just like I. It's like going to the zoo. Like I can't tell you how amazed, fascinated, humbled I am <laughs> by it. <laughs> I just, I'm fascinated by people that can just be around other people all the time. No, so you're wrong okay. or not. Thank Especially God. Especially in the pandemic. Uh -huh. We are, the, I think we're lucky that we've been together for so long that in the pandemic, we can kind of just be like, see ya. Yeah. Like we are, for a while, he wasn't, he wasn't like in a writer's room. So he was able to just stay up all night. So we were on completely opposite sleep schedules. Uh -huh. So there's like a comfort there that there's not a neediness anymore. Nice. And we just, we do our own thing. How did you know you were in love? I mean, I was in love with Dave the second I saw him. Really? No joke. But the second I did saw him. Did you meet him, through Chelsea Pretty? No, we didn't. We That was like afterwards that I realized they knew each other. We I met him at a party. I saw him at a party. I was there with Lauren Greenberg. Uh-huh. Ah! The best. Greatest person ever. Um, By the way, Lauren Greenberg, if I have not told you this story, Lauren Greenberg now runs the James Corden she's show. She's the head writer at James <laughs> Corden. I, and I used to sit with her at her, we used to go to her ex-boyfriend's apartment because there was air conditioning. So we would sit there because of the air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And she would hand me her phone and I would answer the calls of debt collectors for her. Yeah. And I'd just be like, Lauren's passed. Sorry. She's passed! <laughs> and that was all, like, before you hired her, and now she's, like, running one of the most popular shows on TV. This is just, I think, a really quick, um, as, as Rami said last week, he went, this is a tangent even for a podcast. <laughs> I mean, but podcast is just one giant tangent. But for anyone who is sort of starting out in any field, Lauren Greenberg, um, I think Kevin Christie maybe turned me on to her. I was writing shows and I was hiring all these people that had, you know, tons of credits that had written on these huge shows like Frasier and Friends and Mad About You and all the shows that I grew up loving. And I realized that sometimes when you hire incredibly experienced people, um, they, uh, um, what's the word? They don't care about you. you <laughs> You're beneath them. Give a shit. It they was, don't like you. Yeah, they <laughs> frankly don't like you. That's like maybe a better way to put it. I think there's something to be said for a younger person who's never written on a show almost being more valuable than someone that's been doing it for 30 years who's written on every show because it's just sort of like there's not an excitement. There's yeah. not an a, a alacrity about doing it. There's just sort of not a a, a, um, a grit that I think is so essential yeah. to writing shows. There's not a dismissiveness of like, oh, that's not going to work. It's like, well, that just shuts down your creativity, you know? Yeah. And so that's why I'm so people have this like eye roll thing about young millennials now. Like they're so like needy and annoying and whatever the stereotype is. I completely disagree like young people if you just get your ego out of the way like they can teach you so much so I just like young people who haven't already been programmed to think a certain way yeah you know it's like when you hook up with a guy who's been in a long relationship and he goes down on you and like does something like super specific and you're like okay I now know exactly how your ex has an <laughs> orgasm <laughs> I know so much about her, but let's just regroup. <laughs> just like, and you're like, okay, all right, like, copy that. I know her inside and out, but the we're going to have to start over. <laughs> Female body, they're like snowflakes. Everyone is different. So the same thing kind of happens in any show. <laughs> <laughs> in any job you know so um someone recommended me this girl lauren greenberg she had hilarious tweets and i called her in and she right she was very nervous she was incredibly nervous in the meeting which i see i love that <laughs> I loved it. I hate it when people pretend they're something they're not and then you have to enter into some shitty, like mm. bad long form improv with them. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I like it when someone's just like, I'm really nervous. This is very overwhelming. I'm like, <laughs> great. This is a person that tells the fucking truth. Already love you. Yeah. You're already not pretending you can like are doing something or I know you're not going to lie to me yeah. moving forward. You know, there's yeah. nothing worse than someone's like, I got that. And they have no idea how to do it. And by the way, I always believe that person. I'm like, oh, they got it. They I, said they got it. Okay. So I'm following them. 
<laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. Never goes well. The person who always says, I know, I got it, no problem, that person is like a fucking mess and nothing's <laughs> going to get done right. I like the person that's like, I don't know how to do this. Could someone teach me? And I'm like, I can trust you. <laughs> I know that you're going to get the solution instead of pretend you know something you don't. Yes. So Lauren comes in. She's nervous. She's like, I'm really nervous. I'm like, I already love you. We start talking. I guess her mom had put her on a dating app without telling her. Yeah. Lauren is a funny, like... Her story is wild. And she was working at a company that measures your food ahead of time for you, like with scoops. Yeah. Like pre-measured scoopers so that you could like like ascertain how many calories you're about to eat. Anyway, we start talking. She's she's like shy and nervous, mm -hmm. I can tell, which is what how I was in the beginning. And then she just like started crying. <laughs> No way. I swear to God. Lauren, no. And I was like, uh, and I knew I was going to give her the job. And I'm such a dick that I was like, how oh, should I tell her? Should I wait? Oh, I'm going to wait. I'm going to make her sweat it out. No. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm going to make her sweat it out. And then, because uh, I don't, you have to like run it by like HR before you officially hire someone, right? And uh, especially if they're crying. Yeah. She wasn't like, crying. And to me, I think most people will leave that meeting going, I cried in a meeting. I just blew it. Yeah. You know? And I remember just going, someone who is that raw and that close to their emotions is like the quarterback for a fucking writer's room oh yeah and they're the funniest person oh wait i would like she is so damaged <laughs> she's <laughs> that she just might work hysterical <laughs> like i know she is funny like she's literally on the verge of tears at all times you're hired <laughs> and you know what else i liked about her anyone that is working in a job where you're not sure if you uh how you work, like people, we all work differently, right? The same way we all remember things differently. Like if I need to learn something, I'll make a song out of it or I'll record it on voice memos and listen back to it. That's just how I learn. Mm. I'm not a very visual learner. I'm a very audio learner. Knowing how you work. When I first started writing on the roasts, I was not good in a room. Like I wasn't like snap, 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 snap. Like I would just get shut down because I, at the time I was just too insecure and I was like so worried about laughing at everyone else's jokes yeah. to make them feel good that I wasn't thinking of my own jokes. Whereas in a writer's room, you kind of just have to like, n you know, not laugh at anybody else. It's, it's always, it's also weirdly competitive and stuff. And then I would go away and write for two hours alone and pound out four pages of jokes and then send them in. Yeah. That's just how my brain worked. Yeah. That's how Lauren was too. In a room, she was kind of quiet, but then she was the sniper who would, you know, and I started learning. I was like, Lauren, you want to just break off? And she'd go off and just send in 10 pages of brilliant jokes. I've had the exact same experience with her. She wrote on a web series I did for MTV called Esther with Hot Chicks, like literally maybe eight years ago. And she was quiet. And then she was the funniest. Dude. She made the show. Do not conflate quiet with weak. Do She's not the best lesson of that because she, you, can, I can't do anything without her punching it up. She is so funny. It is, she lives and breathes comedy writing, but yeah. at the same time, who she is, it just doesn't make any sense. But the loudest person is not necessarily the most talented, is not necessarily the most competent, is not necessarily the funniest or the best at their job. You know, Benton and I fight about this all the time because Benton, when he He's quiet. I fill in the blanks with my own insecurities. It's this awful Mad Libs game where I'm like, are you mad at me? What are you doing? Why aren't you talking to me? And he's like, I'm just focusing. Like, I, I think that... I have that with Dave, too. Insecure people, sometimes we think that the person in the meeting that talks the most is the best at their job mm -hmm. and that is not necessarily true yeah it's interesting learning all these things like it's like oh we've been around the block we know some <laughs> i know it's because i used to just like bleh, 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 bleh. i was the person in the meeting that was like talk the whole time but say nothing of value yes. my favorite person in the meeting says nothing and then speaks at the end just hold let everyone else embarrass themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do your research do some recon let everyone else screw up raise your hand and have the fucking solution be the fucking mic drop. That's you know, such good advice. Be the sniper that yes. comes in later. Be quiet. Be quiet. I've told the advice we're giving women. Be have quiet. A, be quiet. <laughs> lean out. Do not lean in. Lean out. Lean Shut your down. poor mouth. <laughs> <sighs> okay. I'm obsessed with this company. Hold on. This is, we're taking a break to talk about Stitch Fix, but I want to pull it up on my computer because I was on their website. Will you start talking and then by the time yeah, I'm I find it, I'll chime truly in. I'm really very thankful for this company. Stitch, oops, uh, sorry. I'm <laughs> Stitch fix. Welcome. <laughs> um, Sorry, yeah, that was a fart. I, I'm super, super thankful for this company because uh, you need it. You need Excuse it me? desperately and you need it truly. And you know what? I'm fine with that. Like, 
this company, they do these incredible styling arrangements where they pick your clothes for you. You take a quiz and you tell them their sizes and they'll send you the clothes you should be wearing. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not. Really, we all need it. So you're not left to your own devices like me because I am constitutionally incapable of just buying versatile basics. Yeah. And they will send you clothes that, first of all, fit. Which, you know, when I order clothes from most uh, websites, order I, three. I order three. <laughs> I order a small, medium, large, try them all on, and then return the two that don't fit. Because I never know what's going to fit, ever. But Stitch Fix, they're, it's basically a personal styling company that makes getting the clothes you love effortless in a time where everything is difficult. This is not written on the copy. This yeah. is me just and improvising. And for you, they give you the clothes you need, not the clothes you love. <laughs> because nowhere in the quiz does it say, do you like shopping at gas stations? There are no options to have nine vintage wolf shirts delivered to you, but they won't do it. <laughs> Stitch Fix and I are going to talk about it. We're going to get we're going to have a creative meeting. But no, this this company is amazing because, you know, sometimes you go shopping and you come home and you realize you have no clothes that you can actually wear to work or that you can actually wear to a wedding or you can actually wear to a professional environment. You're like, I have nine velour vintage running shorts yeah, and I, I got it. two pairs of, you know, uh, crocodile knee high boots for the club, but I don't have yeah. a I don't have a white Oxford shirt for a freaking Zoom meeting. Um, so what they do is they basically you go to stitchfix.com slash Whitney, set up your profile, and they're going to deliver clothes personalized just for you, color, style, and budget, which I love because I also, I wear like four colors. Yeah. I, I've picked four colors. They're the ones that work for me. And I'm just like, only send me stuff in this because there's nothing more annoying when you find something really cute and it just comes in only one dumb color. And you're like, God damn it. Yeah, like chartreuse. You're like, what is this? Yeah, with cerulean. You pay $20 for a styling fee for each fix, which is credited towards anything that you keep, right? So you can schedule it at any time. There's no subscription required if you're commitment phobic. And shipping returns and exchanges are easy and free. If you're not looking uh, at the YouTube, I'm holding up this dress that I really, really want. But if you are looking at the how YouTube. How cute is that? Oh. Well, if you're not, look on YouTube. <laughs> I'm on the Stitch Fix website. Hold on. Do you see That's how, beautiful. How cute is she that? She looks like the galaxy. Yeah, it's like a, I don't think they would send this to me necessarily. I'm probably not hip enough or young enough. But it's this really cute navy blue dress that's like knee length, long sleeve that looks like paint splatter constellation. And I really yeah, want it. Yeah, everything is gorgeous. And the fact that they, they cater it to your style and your budget is really unique and i also like yeah it's like going on 50 websites to look for clothes it's like it's 4 30 by the time you're done looking yeah, for one wanna, outfit you don't want to have to type in horses in every search box <laughs> on every website this one will just find them all at once <laughs> get started today at stitchfix.com slash whitney and you'll get 25 percent off when you keep everything in your fix stitchfix.com slash whitney for 25 percent off when you keep everything in your fix stitch Fix.com slash Whitney. Benton first came in this morning with a Sussex accent. Which I love. How how, how was that? <laughs> it's, can you read the copy in it, please? About try. article furniture? Oh, hang on, I have to get into it. Go. Hi, you look gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> you look beautiful today. It's article. When it's time for a change, your home is the perfect place to store. Article makes it easy to create space that reflects for you personally. <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled and your Instagram open for inspirational pictures and articles like this collection, darling. Um, <laughs> is that pretty good? Yeah, that was actually very impressive. It's it's almost too good to be too funny. I was actually just like wondering if you had a dialect coach mm -hmm. um, for this podcast. They can teach me everything but English. For real. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm obsessed with article furniture. Uh, Tr truly? No, truly. Whitney is obsessed with it. She has more outdoor article furniture than she has outdoors. <laughs> I I got I I think that my home style is so weird that I just can never find any furniture that I like and it's it's so much pressure because it's such a commitment you're like the idea is to have this forever mm -hmm. like I change my style my hair my eyeliner I I don't want to have to change my chair once a year like I want something that I know my future self is going to like and everything I see on that website I know I'm going to like in 20 years yeah you've loved everything you've got both I mean every, I love everything I have too my favorite uh I have two outdoor chairs that I got that are almost like this really like chic like scandinavian rustic modern um there it's just like the, it's just like a perfect architecture and then didn't i just order yeah, and we built those chairs and they were super easy to put together yeah i and then which i appreciate because I, I, have, I hate ordering furniture and it's like 40 
it's What's just like, like a nightmare. I know you like get a sciatica trying to assemble them. And then what was what did I just order? I was like, you ordered two more outdoor chairs. I know, but they, no, they're loungers. <laughs> they're they're like these gorgeous, gorgeous loungers that I'm going to put outside my bedroom. It's like your Marie Antoinette. You need a fainting couch everywhere you go. <laughs> Like at any moment, you could just pass out. I need the opportunity to lay down in case I get the vapors. I know. Could you imagine? Oh, <laughs> but I mean, we almost ruined our friendship with me making sure you ordered these article. Because you asked me, you'll, you'll send a link. She'll be like, "Order this," and I'll be like, "I did it." And she's like, "Did but did you order it?" But where is it? And I'm like, "I did order it. It'll be here the end of May." You're like, "But did you order it?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I lied. It's a fun game I like to play. Article combines the curation of boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. Article's team of designers focus on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, durable construction, dedicated to a modern aesthetic of mid-century. This is the perfect way to describe it. Mm -hmm. They know how to describe it. Maybe I should just Who leave knew? it to them. Mid-century Scandinavian industrial and bohemian. That is the perfect way I to mean, describe it. I mean, it's gorgeous furniture. If you get it, I mean, everyone around you will be like, I'm sorry, are you the most successful 20-year-old I know? I know. It's just like, it's all so chic. It's so classic. It's so, um, what's the opposite of corny? It's like... Um, chic. yams. Yams. Potatoes. <laughs> It's just like it, it. It just it also is so um scrumptious. Like it's like uh, very. Uh, I mean, it's effortless. Yeah, delicious. I don't know. I can't. You guys got the point, right? I can't explain <laughs> it. It just makes me feel so fancy. It makes me feel like such an adult. Uh, also, ridiculously fair prices. You save up to thirty percent mm -hmm. off traditional retail prices. You know me. I open other websites constantly and look for chaise lounges, and I'm like, I'm not paying two thousand dollars for. Like I just refuse. I don't to want do. a lounge that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather lean. Yeah, <laughs> I'd rather lean against a wall than pay that. And it's, it, this, this, I, you can't really relax in a lounge chair if you if it was $5,000. Yeah. <laughs> I will I'll just lie if there it, resentful. If it was your life savings, you can't relax. I know, that. there's nothing relaxing about it. Knowing that you paid a reasonable price is half of why it's relaxing in the first but place. But Article... They're super fast shipping. It's That's right. contactless now. They, yep. go right, they drop it off right at Free your door. Free on orders over $999. Oh, yeah. Offer is... Uh, uh, yeah. Article is offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Go to article.com slash Whitney, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. Take a picture of it and send it to me. Tag me. I'll repost that's it. That's an amazing deal. $50. I know. That's crazy. And we're at home a lot now, so now is the time. It's summer to refresh your patio or front y yard or bedroom. That's article.com slash Whitney to get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. More. I love article. They're, uh, everything in the background of my photos in my backyard are article furniture if you want to see some pieces. At this point, that's true. Mm -hmm. As women and the men listening, this is important uh, to know as well, like that it has taken so long for us to get a seat at the table that it's like, I have so much to say and like I really need to like prove my worth. And I think, you know, there's this sort of urgency to contribute and to finally be included. And we feel like we have to like earn our spot that we already yeah, have. It's, it's fun. You get the spot and now it's a da it's a daily countdown to when I'm going to lose this. You know, yeah. this has to be ephemeral. And, you know, I think that for me in what I do, I talked way too much in meetings all the time because I was so insecure that people were like, because now there's this new moment where people go, oh, you only got that job because you're a girl. Whereas it used to be you didn't get a job if you're a woman. Now it's like, oh, you just got that because we have to meet like a girl quota. Yeah. And and I always wanted to prove I didn't just get this because I'm a girl and they needed to check a box. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I overcompensate. Um. Speaking of overcompensate, mm -hmm. I... Good segue, like a true comic. I found some, one of my favorite... I have a couple of things for you. Okay, so... And I, by the way, you know what we're going to do after this? What? I'm going to let you go through my purse. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Esther does this brilliant thing on her special where she goes through audience members' purses, and it's so fun to watch. I cannot wait. Okay, so I found so my well, this is one of my favorite eye products. <gasps> I it's the Glossier Skywash. Oh my Sheer gosh! But but there's a catch. I brought it for you in the worst color that it comes in. <laughs> I think I'm wearing the worst color eyeliner it's right now. It's called Lawn. Yeah. Open it up. It's so oh. I don't know how anyone makes this work. It's for the I call it the Whitney challenge is you put the <laughs> ugliest color on your eye and then you post it all over social media. A color that you have no chance at it making you look better or flattered. It's absolutely horrible. How sick can you make yourself look? This is for you. 
<laughs> and I do think challenge. it needs to be the Whitney challenge and everyone needs to do it. I would like to be clear that on the podcast table is this yellow, which is what I have on I now. I see it. Okay. Weirdly, you are making it work. You think? In person, it's looking like it's it's making your eye color pop. So I am. Rethinking. Oh, yeah. my gosh. This truly is the Whitney challenge. <laughs> this is a Shrek. How vomit. bad? This is literally just the color of baby shit. But by. <laughs> and I have to try to make this work. By the way, there are so many hot girls out there, though, that love this and this color. And I don't know how or why. Is it eyeliner or eyeshadow? It's a, it's a shadow. So, it, you know, you can, like, line the just the where you have your liner now. Oh, you're going to... Oh, no. She's oh doing God. it now. We're going to do the Whitney challenge oh, no. right now. Oh, no. Oh, no. We have to stop. Is, <laughs> am I losing sponsors as I do this right now? <laughs> is Article Furniture dropping out <laughs> as I do this? Ritual Vitamins is like, we're good. <laughs> Is anything happening? How's it... I put... I'm well, putting it over yellow. Yeah, so it's going to look crazy. Oh, there we go. I can put makeup on without I've seen a you do mirror, this, which is really sad. I've seen you pre-pandemic just pull out in the middle of a comedy club and put <laughs> your dirty ass finger into a concealer and rub it on your face. You're just like filthy <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> a so, filthy animal. This is my concealer Ooh. <laughs> that I literally before I do anything, I just stick my dirty ass finger in it and then do that. It's it's quite <laughs> gross. It's and then right here. And here. I need that. Yeah, I need. Yeah. I need a like you got to do it a little bit around your lips sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So I put a little bit of. I did a little Whitney challenge, but I think this is like the green and the yellow mix. It kind of looks good. Do I look jaundiced? It kind of looks good. Damn it! How ill did? <laughs> Hell. I, I like the idea that you come on here just to try to make me look Uglier. as hideous. It's like Mean Girls. <laughs> <laughs> this is genius. Okay, so we're going to start the Whitney challenge in honor of Esther. It's definitely in honor of you and whatever <laughs> for whatever sick reason. How did this start? How did the the colored eyeliner thing start? I lo I feel like you came here today <laughs> With an agenda. I did. I feel like you've been thinking about this for a while. I have. Because the blue, I loved the blue. Really? But then it's, you know what you did? You do what hmm. Dave says I do, which is like, you take a nice thing and <laughs> then you make it sick. <laughs> you, It's like, because once I started cooking and cleaning in the pandemic, I was yeah. like, oh my God, like, this is so cool. And yeah. then I, and then I made it sick by saying like, now you need me. Now you could, Dave, you could never leave. Right, me right, right, right. Clean for you. So yeah. you're, is it pathologized? Is that the word I'm looking for? Yes, okay. yes, yes. No, I can turn anything into a sick codependent addiction. Like anything that starts out fun will then turn into some kind of uh, obligation or uh, <laughs> sick addiction or way to hurt myself. Yep. Um, this, I don't really know how this started. I think I just started going full Jack Nicholson in The Shining with having to be home. For those of you that don't live in California, California has been shut down four months. Yeah. And I have left the premises maybe twice. Um, and I was just getting so bored that I started ordering colored eyeliners and putting on like electric blue eyeliner because fuck it. <laughs> I never got to have like a fun 20s and I feel like I'm having it now. I I, I relate to that. I'm a like the mom that's going to steal her husband, like her, <laughs> her, 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 daughter's, so, boyfriend. her daughter's boyfriend. <laughs> I'm just like, I never had my 20s. Like, I feel like that's the, the route I'm going. Um, I, I don't think any of it looks good. It just, it makes, it entertains me. I think it's cool. I think it's good for the makeup, the pro makeup movement. Yeah, we need you. We need someone who's going to experiment, especially in like a casual quarantine way. I'm. A you know a lot about makeup. I do. Yeah, I think another compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a big makeup uh, YouTube. Uh, no, so I have a makeup podcast called Glowing Up, right. which you will be on. Yes, I'm please. Warning you. I would uh, truly love to. And we talk a lot about like skincare, makeup, food. Like we're obsessed with what celebrities eat. Yeah, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, we'll have you on there. I would love. I would love. Yeah, I don't I don't really know how this happened. I also I think it also this is so gross, but that's what we do on this podcast is we like tell our deepest, darkest secrets. I wear too much lip gloss. I thought that was my th everyone's got their thing. Hmm. Eyeliner, mascara, blush. Like if you ha oh, could only wear one thing, what would it be? Mascara. Mascara. OK. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mine would be foundation. Right. Oh. Whoa. Scary. <laughs> no. Well, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> And mine would be foundation. Oh, That's yeah. what I'm the most insecure about. 
Um, but I always wear like too much lip gloss and on the podcast it just looks crazy. And I also uh, started getting zits around my lips that like looked like herpes. So I was like, I'm gonna stop wearing so much lip gloss. And then I was like, but I gotta go crazy with the eyeliner. Just attention at all costs, really. <laughs> Does at all costs. Bad attention? I'll take it. I also think like as I get older, like I don't, it's weird. I, I When I was younger, I was like so precocious and that was my thing. And I like dressed like Annie Hall and like wore blazers. And I feel like now I like dress from like the kids from Stranger Things and I'm like wearing colored eyeliner. Well, I do. I'm feel like Benjamin like, Button. <laughs> I feel like when we were doing stand up like, you know, 10 years ago, there was a little bit of a pressure to kind of dress like a guy. Huge. Don't ever show any Huge. like don't let them just dis be distracted by your your chest like, yes hide it all and now i feel like we're just finally becoming a little you're allowed to be feminine, feminine. yeah that's it i am wearing an oversized t-shirt and sweatpants <laughs> and that is just who i am um as dave says i dress like a celebrity who just got off a like six hour flight like, <laughs> i would say you look like you dress like a celebrity who just got out of rehab but okay <laughs> oh that's true that's true you do say that all the time <laughs> um but yeah no it is fun to kind of like feel that's interesting like that. you and i were facetiming uh and i was like I, it, it was like a weird angle and i was like you have boobs <laughs> it was so weird like in our the same thing to you. in our business like you can know someone for years and have no idea the shape of their body because of the way that we have to dress to try to not make male comics want to fuck us it's or not make it our fault when they do it's true how could you beguile me with that waistline I see you, Esther, like coming down the hallway and I'm like, is that a sleeping bag? <laughs> like, what are you wearing? What is hap? Is that a Snuggie? Is that a slanket? I mean, you do really dress. It's I, I don't I can't tell if I, it seems healthy. Is it like have you like zippers or just not? <laughs> you're not a zipper person. That's just never been for you. I like to be comfortable. I, I respect that. I do. It doesn't sound like you I know. Do. I know. I I just lied, and I felt it. <laughs> I actually cannot lie. As someone who was a pathological liar my entire twenties, I don't do it anymore, and I'm rusty. And that was a horrible. I was. I literally was like, no. I respect that. I looked up into my head. That was like lying 101. Uh, I just lied to you. Uh, that's called authenticity, folks. I I I don't. I okay. The truth is. I, I did, am I like a creepy old man? I did love watching your special and see you all dolled up. <laughs> and I remember going, why does she hide that cute as a button body? <laughs> am I a creepy old man? I remember yes. being like, why doesn't she dress like this all the time? I was cat calling you in my head. That is the greatest compliment I could ever receive. And Annie Agreed. Letterman is always like, Esther, you look like you just, you woke up five minutes before your spot mm -hmm. and you were in a panic. Let's just not take fashion advice from Annie who wears like, uh, she dresses like uh, like Madonna in um, uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. She really does. <laughs> she absolutely does. But by the way, I saw her on your Instagram the other day in like a like a baby blue jacket and we've, we found, she found her groove. Okay. She mm -hmm. found the Whitney approval. Yes, but what 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 women in their clothes is very emotional, mm -hmm. right? It's there's something going on when we wear clothes. I think to um, sort of solve a problem. Well, yeah, to to flatter your body type yeah. for me and to, what? Yeah, this you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a compliment, and it is the opposite. <laughs> I thought she was going. What you're so. You have such a flattered no, body type. No. It was a what? No. You dress like shit. Okay. I don't want to forget this question oh. that I have for you. Okay. You are, you don't think you are, but the way I view you is as like the queen of productivity. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know, have you gotten into a pandemic-y productivity groove? And if so, what what is it? What advice mm -hmm. do you have? Because I want productivity advice from the woman who is like, had 14 shows on the air at one time and like that's called addiction <laughs> um that's called workaholism <laughs> uh you know i for some reason i there's this people think that i'm like super productive i appreciate that and i guess the person who is truly uh obsessively overly productive probably would never think they have produced enough so True. of course me going you think i'm productive like i think i'm like a complete slob failure <laughs> I do very well with structure. I remember when Gary Goleman was on the podcast, we talked about this. I think you and I talked about it on FaceTime the other day of like how I I can't just like 
wake up and have a willy nilly like I'll get to it when I get to it because it's four o'clock and I've only like organized my candle drawer you know like I just can't be left to my own devices I do well with routine I also get really brutal migraines which means I have to kind of like do the same thing at the same time every day does that mean like food and water kind of yeah wake up coffee food water you just have to have routine Mm -hmm. so I feel like that was kind of my brain's way of like force I sort of like thank my migraines for helping me be so productive because they force me to be sort of rigid in my scheduling but I'm going to say something crazy you know I'm so glad that you asked that because I think I've learned something this quarantine which is that productivity is not necessarily um I think what you would ostensibly think productivity is. So here's 15 pages of a script or here's 48 jokes or here's, you know, Tangible. whatever you're the blog you're writing or whatever. Like for me, the the my productivity has to do with how I'm living my life in a way where I can actually write about life. So in order for art to imitate life, you have to have a life. And I realized as, you know, there's a reason my last special was about a robot. I had become a robot in life and I was not. I noticed. I, <laughs> I was not living. I was, I was, I think I was so obsessed with being productive, which if I'm going to be honest, is a lot about my fear of aging and the fact that I have been programmed to believe that I am literally a ticking clock and I'm slowly rotting every day, right? <laughs> I did freeze my eggs. Um, by some weird uh, weird uh, stroke of luck. I just, I knocked that out of the way. But I do have in my head this totally artificial stop date where I'm like, I can only do this till I'm 40. I can only be on camera till I'm 40. No one's going to want to see my face on camera after, you know, like I've just, that's, I, when I got in this business, like I was getting offered mom roles when I was 27, you know, like it's, no one wants to see an older woman on camera. I think that's starting to change Mm -hmm. and I think people are starting to realize actually women like are at their best. Like we start discarding women in this business when they are at their peak. (laughs) But I don't know who wouldn't relate to that because it's like it feels like that in work for our business, but also like relationships, Mm -hmm. you know, like I just there's there is this rush and this clock. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it's I, I know. I really, I'm glad you admitted to that because I feel like, oh yeah, like same, like I get it. I don't know. I know so many people who are like, I have to find the person by 27. It's like, you don't even know who you are at 27. You know. You don't need to marry someone before 30. Like you might be a completely different. I mean, if I had married the person I was with when I was 25, I would be visiting a prison every weekend. That's the secret to me and Dave's relationship is we met when I was 24. So he's dated 17 different women. (laughs) Over the last eight years, he's had so many different spicy people come through. So that's how we keep it fresh. I, like, poor Dave. I will he's just, been in 10 relationships. You've been in one. I will just say what my mom says. Poor Dave. Poor Dave. He's put up with so much. But no, you're right. Like, yeah. But you're also, you're incredibly, uh, you're seekers. And you're like, you've grown together, it seems yeah. like. You yeah, know, yeah. like you have to have someone who's, and also all the iterations of you in your 20s were already <laughs> probably saner than me um, now, frankly. But you know, I, th- I think that I have this fear that I only have a certain amount of time and then it's going to be pencils down. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a part of why I am so productive. It's it's really fear driven, frankly. Yeah. What isn't? Though? I also think that <laughs> I, you know, I hate to do this like when I was a woman and starting in our business, like Sunset Boulevard or something. But it, it I do feel like I had to work twice as hard all the time just for people to take me seriously. So I think in my head, I was like, if you just work harder than anyone, no one can say you didn't deserve it. No one can say you fucked people to get yeah. where you are. Like, I just like that was also a very intentional way to inoculate myself against accusations that I didn't get anything that I didn't deserve. Yeah. Because that that my imposter syndrome is already so intense that I didn't want that. But I, I believe that fear can be a really healthy engine if you know how to turn it off and how to manage it and you know what it is. You know, you have are someone that I feel like has a lot of fear and you channel it for good things also. I mean, you've started like four businesses in quarantine. It's pathetic. <laughs> I love Dave it. Is like, Dave is just like, what hole are you trying to fill? It's just like, what is I love it. So you started, truly just started a tie-dye clothing business. I did. I did bring you some. Can't wait. You have given me 
different instructions throughout the quarantine. So I hope I got it right. But let me ask you a question. How can you tell? Because, you know, I mean, Two Broke Girls, the show that I made with Michael Patrick King was just about girls starting businesses. That's true. Yeah. Like, I'm obsessed with girls that are just able to go like, you know, I'm going to start this business. I have this idea. I want to make this jewelry. I want to make this purse. Like, how do you go from... I have this idea to actually executing it and getting like credit card numbers. You <laughs> I'm serious. It's easier than you think. Like, uh, you know, I just I started tie dyeing. I was obsessed with it. And I'm like, I am running out of things to tie dye. And so I just decided you just tie dyed my face <laughs> with this green eyeliner you gave me. Wait, I want to show you what I made for you. And then you. I'm going to make you sort of. <gasps> oh, my God. It's very Whitney. Come it's on. No. It's, it's this is I call this the I spilled my grandma's wine t-shirt and matching mask because my grandma's an alcoholic. I'm obsessed <laughs> with these colors. And you are you said you wanted dark tie dye. You know that pink and red is my power combo. <laughs> oh my god, that's genius. Um, but yeah, no, I just decided like this was something fun to do and. It's not that hard to build a Shopify. It's like it wasn't that hard. And this that's kind of been the the oh my god. Yes. Yes. I love that bra. Oh my god, this is so good on with my red jeans too. Um the motto of my quarantine is like I can do that, you know? Like yes. oh my god, I want to eat a scallion pancake at home. I can make it. Because my I? whole life, I've been the person that's like, how do you do that? I don't know how to do it. So my motto is just like you can figure out the things that look scary to you. And that's that's why you're now looking so cute. And here we are. <laughs> so you basically were like, I'm just going to buy a bunch of T-shirts that I'm going to pay for. Yeah. And then I'm going to tie dye them and I take pictures of them. And then I throw them online and then I post about them. It's really that simple. I, I know. It's See, because I look at you as like, I could never do that. Like, really? I can't even wrap my head around that. But see, that's the person I always have been my whole life is like, how do you do that? Like, yeah. So now I'm just like, you can do it. You figure it out. You Google, you watch YouTube. Like, there's just ways to figure shit out. Right. That's like my motto of being in a pandemic. Yeah. Because we're stuck at home. Yeah. Like, it's you can't use the I don't have time excuse. I mean, like, people are working, of course, still. Right. But that's just like where I'm at. I also just think there's something so amazing about something you truly enjoy doing yeah. and that you don't even realize could be a business. Yeah. It's you know? a, this is a hobby business. Let's make it clear. And I, it is for charity. But it, it, it this is a hobby. Hopefully, maybe someday it'll be a real business. I would love to do clothing instead of comedy. <laughs> If we're being honest, I wouldn't mind making that transition. <laughs> wouldn't be the worst thing for me. Um, but yeah. I am obsessed with that because there's so many things that I really enjoy sort of doing that I'm kind of like weirdly good at, but it would never occur to me like, oh, there's a business here, you know? Yeah. Like. Well, you are doing fine. <laughs> I should be a dog trainer. Let's just face it. That's true. I should be a horse uh, liberty trainer. And I think Chelsea Peretti should be an interior designer and should design Chelsea Peretti everything. should just be the governor. Like, <laughs> Chelsea Peretti is our sort of third... I feel like I just got in on your friendship. I'm like the third wheel of you and Chelsea Peretti's friendship. And it's taught me a lot because, like, they'll FaceTime me in the morning and we'll, like, talk for 30 minutes. No, not about anything in particular, or, frankly, anything at all. It's just more of a like a, a webcam. It's just more like we watch each other make coffee. Like it's a very voyeuristic thing. And then they'll call me back again at like nine. And I truly, my brain is like, did they just pocket dial me? And I'm like, hey guys, what's up? And then I, I truly get confused. And I'm like, didn't we talk this morning? <laughs> And Chelsea just went, it's called female friendship. <laughs> I know you. We're teaching you. And I just realized that because, again, because of what I do, all my friends are like male comics that I talk to like once every couple months. <laughs> Isn't it weird? Yes. I'm learning that guys don't talk about stuff with each other. No. It's so weird. Or to us, <laughs> you know, right. as you may have uh, noticed in the news recently. Yeah. You know, and I think I've been in a lot of friendships. I think it's really interesting. And I think a lot of people can relate to this, like, your work friendships don't count. Yeah, they as don't. full friendships, they don't. You know, so you gotta talk outside of work. You gotta like be hanging out. That's not an emotional support system. The people that are paid to talk to you at work, they don't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> it's also very recent that men and women are sharing a space all day. <laughs> yeah, like it started like thirty years ago. Well, we don't have a ton of practice being together 12 hours straight and like not flirting or yeah. not, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's definitely very weird. And I was uh, hiking with my lover yesterday and uh, we were walking on a hike, 
that was the weirdest. That was a robot <laughs> that's starting to power down. Uh, I need to be plugged robot in. Robot Whitney's coming in. <laughs> Someone smack her. Pour water on her. <laughs> and we were hiking and this a group of like three guy hikers were walking towards us and he my lover like waved at them and was like hey guys what's up and I was like what are you doing and he was like I was just saying hi and I was like oh like I can't say hi to people on a hike or I'm flirting yeah like you know so sometimes you're just trying so hard to not you know be this what they think you are or yeah. give them permission to then you know, enter your space. It was just, I didn't realize like how much energy I just put into like saying hi to strangers or like making sure at work people don't think I'm flirting with them, but also that I'm nice. It's, it takes up a lot of real estate in your brain. Well, it's interesting because I can see how, and I've seen this happen literally the last 10 years with so many women, people will assume, oh, she's mean, but it's yeah. like, you're just like afraid. Like, I just like, don't want to like be overly friendly to everyone because I don't know what that's going to mean to them. And mm -hmm. and I see that with every female comedian I know, except for Annie, who is way too nice to everyone. And it's a problem. And it's so annoying going anywhere with her because she's makes friends with everyone, but to each their own. So funny. Um, But yeah, it's like, oh, you might seem mean, but it's like, you're just like trying I to think exist that safely. We also have to make sure that we like, like remove ourselves from whatever someone's projecting onto us. You know, it's like, I feel like... <laughs> Kevin Christie told me once, uh, he used to go on the road with me. He was like, about 40 minutes into every show, someone gets removed. Like, a, And he goes, about 40 minutes in, you turn into every man's ex-wife. <laughs> like, I think I told this uh, when maybe Fred Armisen was on. Like one time, this guy that I got into the show, he like needed tickets, emailed me, got him seats, the whole deal. Like 40, he was laughing the whole time. And like 40 minutes in, I made some joke about like, guys who have coin jars you know guys have jars of coins yeah. you know and i was like something about coin jar and he just went that's so we can pay for your shit like he just snapped like i just i he per he saw like his ex-wife's face like you know in cartoons when like um the coyote would see the road runner and it would just like turn into a pork chop <laughs> in like a bubble like that's what happens and i think a lot of times people project onto us you know and they're like I'm like, this feels old. Yeah. Like when someone's like, are you fresh. Yeah, when someone's like, are you mad at me? I'm like, this feels old. This feels like you're turning me into someone else. Your mother, your sister, your ex, like someone got like something, Virgin Mary. Like, I don't know, this isn't mine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that um I do think people's default when women are somewhat quiet are they're a bitch, they're cold, they're frigid. And then when a man is quiet, it's sort of like he's just busy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I get it. I'm guilty of it too. Like sometimes yes, someone, doesn't, too. someone doesn't say hi to me and me I'm like, too. they hate me. They, they hate, hate me. me. Yes. Then I'm like, why didn't I say hi? They think yeah. it's the same thing now. Like that was, and, and you're sort of circling each other. But yeah, I just think that like that perseverating in your brain, like that has your reaction to someone not talking to you has so much more to do with you than with them. Yeah. That's like an opportunity to learn about your default <laughs> inner monologue. Yeah. What uh, would you say are your main fears in life? I'm gonna talk through your fears. No, wait, yes. no, <laughs> no. Well, I kind of, I, I feel like you're allowed to be mad at me about this. Um, I was watching your special and I was like, literally the first thing I thought, because I am a creepy old man, I was like, and I was with my lover and uh, we were frankly being predatory. And I was like, she looks fucking stunning like cool like drop dead gorgeous and then you had the audacity frankly to challenge my reality and like say your appearance well i just was like i think there's a little dysmorphia going on not that there's a judgment as someone who's incredibly dysmorphic i think we all have some kind of dysmorphia but i think it's worth like talking about yeah i get this feedback i and i'm totally comfortable with it i i hear you 
I, when I started, I'm not saying see yourself a different way. None of us will ever be able to do that. They say that you if, taught me this. They say if you were able, to, if you ran into yourself on the street, you wouldn't recognize yourself. That's how dysmorphic. I always think about that because you told me that it's very, it's like shocking to hear. But I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I when I started comedy, this is my defense, and it's just and a I'm defense. not attacking you. I know you're not. This is a this is a very aggressive. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> this is a compliment that is an insult wrapped in a compliment. <laughs> that I'm not defending myself, <laughs> but worth noting when I started comedy, I was very different. I yeah. was a bit frumpier. Like yeah. I had just I went to I went away to college and I was miserable. I gained thirty pounds. I was like didn't feel. I, a guy had not hit on me ever. Like, Which, by the way, I hate it. Let me just say this. I hate it when you're feeling gross and not your best. And someone's like, but you look gorgeous. And you're like, I need to put makeup on. You don't need to wear makeup. I fucking hate that shit. This isn't about what you think of me. It's yeah. what I think of me. Yeah. So so I just want to be very clear about that. Thank you. Wait, I, did you just scratch your face? Did I do something? Do you see there's a little red on your face? Okay. okay now, hold on. It's not bad. Hold on. No, just. <laughs> don't touch me. I just. <laughs> don't touch me. Oh, sorry. We're in a. Did you? I think it was just a little piece of um, like lipstick or something. Is it gone? It's gone now. I think okay. you just scratched your face and it left a little mark, a little red mark, because oh, you're I such a delicate flower. Like how I look. It's at fine that. now. Um, yeah, I I I needed to adjust a little bit because some, you know, that was my first special, so there was stuff in there that might feel like it doesn't fit who I am now, and I tried to cut most of that but I, I know what you mean and we are dysmorphic and we do see ourselves I think it's important to talk about though you know I think there's something really powerful to me like like going oh my gosh this girl's so gorgeous and this is our society is so fucked up that this is the way we see ourselves you know it was just sort of like there was something really powerful about it and there was something um really poignant about that well, I I feel that with you a lot too where I was I think I've said this to you before but like you are not what you you don't match what you look like at all you know like because you're this like tall really attractive like powerful woman but you're really weird <laughs> and you dress quite frankly confusing <laughs> you don't dress for what you have it, it's just it's and that's you've been a lesson to me that like oh not every hot girl is like perfect and like <laughs> like talks like this it's, <laughs> you know you're you're weird too which has been really fun for me She's to learn part of why we're soulmates <laughs> but you know it was it was interesting it really brought up a lot for me like if you have a uh, triggered reaction to something it's all yours and I yeah. remember going like oh my god I. The fact that I was like, why doesn't she wear a skirt all the time? Like, what kind of fucking nasty, pervy monster am no, I? That's so nice. You know? That's complimentary. I really... I think so there's nice. something super fucking rebellious and badass that we just get to dress like we shit. shop at gas stations. Like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. Like, shit. You know? Like, I just feel like there's so much shit. Like, I was um fighting with... Uh, Taylor Tomlinson the other day. I mean, it was a it, it was a real fight. I mean, it was like a full because there was a comedian who I think is brilliant, female comic who was wearing in one of her specials like like a shirt that was just like a little sloppy, like the way that I dress all the time, frankly. And I was like, why isn't she like dressing up a little bit? It's her special. Like, I want everyone to like be a TV star, and I'm like, yeah. and I'm like fully male gazing at being like, how, and he's, she's like, are you telling a woman, like, are you trying to say a woman should dress sexier? And I was like, I think I am. Like, I guess I'm sexist. Like, what is this? Like, I really have so much old nasty programming yeah. about how women too. should dress. I absolutely do too. And I fully boycott all of it mm -hmm. by dressing like a boy from the 70s, mm -hmm. but I definitely, um, I get so controlling about how and triggered about how well, other women dress. But I think there's something cool to that because it's it's like, oh, you have your own taste. You have your own idea. Mm -hmm. And I think I always respect that when someone has a take. Yeah. Because that's like a comedian thing. So yeah. I think that's cool. What is your advice uh, to people in relationships? How to sustain? Because um, I have none. It's. <laughs> well. I'm in awe of you. Be, be committed like despite whatever you know it's mm. like you just know you're staying so it does not matter what has been said what has happened like and also once you go through a certain amount of things and a certain amount of time you're just 
you get through it and you're like, oh, we're just like family now. And this is incest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, like there's no one. I could never re go through all of this with anyone else. It's like we're just stuck. Like and it's but that's uh, that's kind of like the shitty way of putting it. It's no, like, that is no, that's it's bril- It's so simple, but also so brilliant. And um uh, a good girlfriend of mine who Ginny Goodwin, who reminds me a lot of you, actually, uh, she said to me once she just went, I'm like, why are you always in such good relationships? She's in this amazing marriage. And I'm just like, what? And she goes, uh, she realized she goes, oh, leaving's not an option. So when you fight, yeah. leaving's not an option. And it's something that I never thought of before because the only leverage I've ever had is, well, I'm going to fucking leave. Right. You know, and you use that and you play that card and you want, that's how you're going to control the person. Is like, I'm going to, if I'm here, what control do I have over you? Yeah. The only, so I, and as someone who saw people break up a lot, yeah. growing, I, I just thought, oh, if things get hard, you fucking leave. Right. You know? But the thing is, is like, I know that if things get hard, it's like something that I'm, it's like, something's wrong with me and I have to go through something. It's not like I I had this like big kind of mental break in January where like I was just kind of freaking out about my life. And I, I remember. And I was like, at one point during it, I was like, maybe Dave is the problem. And then, <laughs> and then like the next day I was like, Dave is not the problem. I need to go on medication. Like <laughs> he's, but you, you know what I mean? Like you just kind of it's easy to go through a depression and think, oh, it's the relationship. Yeah. It's just, it's easy to like, to point that as a problem, but usually mm-hmm. that's not the problem. I mean, yeah. obviously the, it can be. The but fact that I think the best man ever is the problem is probably. Exactly. Yeah. That you, but my, but my point is, it's not like I'm in some relationship where I'm like, everything is perfect. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. And like, we just can't stop touching each other. Yeah. It's, no, like we're just real. We're honest. We're like, I'm like, just shut up right now. I just, <laughs> sometimes we'll be eating together and he'll be asking me questions. And I'm like, I just want to eat right now. Like, I don't want to talk while I'm eating. And he's like, okay, thanks for telling me. I love that. <laughs> that's because that's my thing. Don't you run out of shit to talk about? Yeah. I am so in awe of people in long relationships. I'm like, oh, like, how was your day? Like, it's like Groundhog Day. It's like, dude, like, I do need to be able to be in something where I can go like, can I, we just take a day where I just don't talk? It's like. I it, need that. I need that. And I need a lot of time to recharge. That's what we have too. And also like he'll like do this thing where he'll tuck me in. Like he'll say goodnight to me. I go to bed and he goes and does like work And I or put whatever. my hair in pink tails yeah. and put on a little schoolgirl <laughs> skirt. Me. It's like super normal. <laughs> and and uh, uh, almost every me. night I'll be like, he'll be like, okay, good night. And he'll be walking out of the room and I'm like, what are you going to do? And he's like, stop asking me that (laughs) he's like don't ask me what am i gonna do i can't stand it you know what i'm gonna do so it's like just the gonna go jerk off (laughs) to porn (laughs) just like the ability to that's but i like that in all my relationships friendships just the ability to be like shut up yeah don't ask me that yeah you're annoying yes yes okay and a quick recovery time of not internalizing yeah. that, you know, like like that. I think it's not about the absence of fights. It's not that there are never going to be arguments. It's about if you're able to deal with them maturely, not blow them out of proportion and recover quickly, forgive quickly. Yeah. But I think that I don't want to blow past this because it's like I do think so much of the way we have altercations with the person we're in relationships with hinges on. But this could end. This could be it. So if you're just like we're in this, it's like. All of a sudden, the things you're, you're fighting safe. about, the, you're, yeah, the things you're fighting about just sort of get de-escalated because you're like, okay, well, what's going to happen? We're yeah. staying together, so yeah. what are we doing here? Like, let's yeah. just skip to the end of the movie here. We yeah. know how this is going to end. Let, why are we doing this? But by the way, I don't want to come on here and talk like, oh, we're together forever. It's perfect. Like, we're engaged. Mm-hmm. That was, for me, what was really important is, and that's why he hates when I say this, but I a little bit strong-armed him into proposing to me. He hates when I say that. But wasn't Sorry. it like four years in? It was many more than that. Okay, so yeah, no. <laughs> that's not, that is the most insane thing I've ever heard. It's, you're not strong-arming someone after f- seven years. But once we were engaged. Frankly, he he had it too good for too long. Oh, no, he's going to get mad. <laughs> <laughs> once we were engaged. He, Dave doesn't listen to my podcast. <laughs> Well, Trust me. <laughs> once we were engaged, I got a lot more secure and I got a little bit more normal and less crazy. Mm. But when we weren't engaged and I, I was like mad at I was low key like mad at him for yeah. a while and acting out and yeah. like you, you know, I had this like resentment that he w- hadn't proposed to me. But now that we're engaged, I don't even need to get married. I'm like, yeah, I just have a security that I realizing I needed. I was insecure. I needed that. I so love that's that you helpful. can just say that. And I think that that is so important 
that it, it, it's important. It tells the world. There's a reason. There, it tells the world. You can kind of stop thinking about it. Yeah. You know. And, but by the way, it all, it's all meaningless. He could break up with me any day. Like, that's, yes, you know, of it's course. It's a fake thing. Right. But it just for some reason like gave me peace. It'd be mind. harder. <laughs> It'd be harder to leave. You know, so much of marriage... I'm not giving a ring back. You know, yeah, sort of like... <laughs> it's a family diamond. It's not going back to you no matter what. It'd be an incredible... Speaking of strong arming, <laughs> you would have to strong arm this ring off me in my sleep. You know, I do think, though, I remember as a person who, again, made a show about what's the point of marriage? Why do we have to sign something? Why do we have to do... What are all these sort of, like, formalities? Like, what is all these traditions? Like, I'm the person that's like, marriage was invented in order to keep land in the family. Like, I had all, a million things to get out of, you know, to sort of deal with uh, what is, is actually just, frankly, fear of intimacy and fear of someone seeing me completely because I just figure if someone sees everything, they'll be disgusted by me, right? So... I was talking to uh, uh, my friend Kevin Christie, who we've talked about already on this oh, podcast, Kevin. and we were, he's the smartest, he's so smart. When and I, matter of fact, no bullshit. Kevin is, Kevin is to me as Whitney Cummings is to you. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> Kevin is who I call when I need an answer to something. And he, also brilliant artist, he's been doing brilliant work during the quarantine. Um, artists are making incredible things. I'm starting to be grateful for this pandemic. Um, but he said uh, something to me once, and I was like, what's the point of getting married? What's the point of marriage? Like, why do you have to do the whole thing? Like, rah, 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 the whole rigmarole. And he goes, weddings are important rituals so that your friends hold you accountable. You know, so that everyone in your life, like you can't pull a fast one. You can't worm your way out. You can't cheat. We all fucking drove to Santa Barbara. <laughs> we put on suits. We sat through this thing. We paid for hotels and we're, we're going to hold you accountable. You know, we're going to bear witness to this choice you made. And like, there's no secrets anymore. There's no rigmarole anymore, you know? And I think that I appreciated that, you yeah. know, like I, I, I liked that idea. I liked that, like, you know, you get 50 people there to go, yeah, we see you and we're not going to let you be shady. And we're now all acting accordingly. We're a part of this. We're a part of yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. I got you a wedding gift. <laughs> we're not going to do a secret trip to Vegas. Like, <laughs> I got you a vase. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not the friend who's going to participate in that shit. You know, I we've all made an agreement that you're not going to be fucking scummy. Oh, my you know, God. I, yeah. I, I I had never heard it put that way before. You know, I like that. Your family is here. Your grandma almost had a stroke on the fucking plane. Like this is so I, I now I now I under I don't know why I needed to be explained the value of that ritual, but that's OK. That's I who you are. I know. <laughs> It's okay to be. It's okay to be you. People that have to explain very basic things to me that most people learned at like twelve. I'm I learning now. Dave says I have a similar thing. He's yeah, like, you, you're learning how to live at 32. Well, I think comedians are very much like we're the people that mock tradition and criticize tradition and want to question everything. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I get why this has been being done for thousands of years. It right. works. It works. Well, actually, I, wait, <laughs> actually, I do want to be normal. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Like, I'm the person. I mean, I was in a fight with someone the other day about, like, drinking water. And she was just like, are you arguing with me about drinking water? <laughs> like, I was like, you don't need eight glasses a day. Like, you can get water from other things. Like, if you have fruit or watermelon. And she was just like, are you... Do you have a hot take on hydration? What's the point? Like, why are you arguing? That? You know, like, I think it's valuable to question everything, but there's also a point where you have to go like, you know what? So Esther does this hilarious thing in her special where she goes through audience members' purses. So I thought I would let you go through my purse. This is a dream. But I also... That's why I do what I do. I, <laughs> I also haven't used it. And like, a, I haven't been going a lot of places. So this was my purse like a month ago. Really? Yeah. I mean, I I mean. And you don't like empty it out or need. This so is gonna big. be bad. It's so big. This is gonna be bad. Don't go through it. Okay. I feel like this <laughs> is gonna be embarrassing. Don't pre examine. Okay, so this is Esther's just going through my purse. Okay. Oh, this is how you do it. Okay. Hold on. What? Why? <laughs> why? Why? Whitney, why is there a ball, a toy? That's a dog ball for when I find a stray dog. I really? Always, I always have one. This yeah. is for stray dogs. Uh -huh. That is so <laughs> sweet. Wow. Oh, I've been looking for those. <laughs> 
They're mine now. Are, These are so good. You can have them. They, These you are can have them. So good. Finders keepers. They're, the mo- they're it's like the they're Tiffany's sh- of they're sh- they're gummy bears it? with champagne in them. Houseware. It's called self care. You can have that. No, no, no. I have uh, ten boxes of them. Dry shampoo. Oh, I need that. This is the, um, uh, yeah, dry shampoo. Wait, it's the large, that's not a, tr- they make these in smaller <laughs> sizes for the purses, though. Oh, my God. Wait. Oh, no, that bag is really sketchy. My wallet, okay. Ooh, a Stella McCartney bag. Wait. What's that? Healing balm. Oh, this is good stuff. It's called All Good Balm. It's just like, what's that? Oh, that's a really good, this is a good lip balm I really like. It's called Oilio Oiso. So usually I'm people, this. Bo- this is crazy deep pockets what? with highlighters, I mascara, like- <laughs> not makeup highlighters, actual <laughs> office highlighters with the concealer. This is a really good, I this is a sunscreen makeup stick, right? but I use it as lip balm. What? Uh-huh. Don't stop. Don't film her doing that. It's very inappropriate. <laughs> What else? Uh, NARS lip gloss. I'm liking it. The- oh, this is a really good lip gloss. Makeup forever. Ooh, I've been looking for this. You have a lot of li- like. Oh, don't- this is a lip stain. This is my favorite lip stain that I have used since I was in college. It is the Body Shop lip stain. I've been using this for truly 20 years. I Not mean, this bottle. Formulas have been revisited. This- you maybe need to like. <laughs> this is my favorite. What's that? Two Altoids. Two Altoids. You never know. I do not want to have slamming breath. That's my. That is truly my nightmare. There What's are that? so many loose Altoids at the bottom. What's that? Oh look, that's a lip balm. Oh, I love this bombed aesthetics. I love this brand. It's a lip balm that's like a little. Look how you open it. What's that? Loose Altoids. Anyone? <laughs> She's just holding on to these. A lifesaver where the lifesaver is glued to the package. You know when it's been in there for too many seasons and it's melted and remelted and all that. Oh, there's like powders in here <laughs> from all the Altoids. Oh, <laughs> loose gum. Whitney, you're like, you're like rich. Like you shouldn't have loose gum. You're successful. <laughs> you never know when you're going to need gum but not have time to unwrap it. It's so nasty in here. <laughs> it's so nasty. I'm like not enjoying this. <laughs> I know you, you, you know, on her special, she does this and it's really fun and funny. This is more like sad. Oh my god! I thought this. I thought I was like, oh, she's like a cinnamon stick in her purse. That's like so chic, like to make it smell good. This is fucking rawhide. This is a bully stick. This is a dried bull dick that Ew. I use to lure in stray dogs when I need to catch them. You never know. This is just like the lowest <laughs> option of Welch. Like, why? I don't even have shit to say. Just lost our Welch's sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this isn't really. I feel like when you normally do this, it's like funny. This is just weird. <laughs> what are these? <laughs> Bent up pills. Let me see what kind of pills. What those do you are. think those are? These are. I think these might be ritual vitamins. No, they're not. I know what ritual vitamins are. Those are not them. They have little powder in them. Gar- garlic, garlic, like ginkgo it. biloba, maybe. It does smell like it. Oh, the- it. I take one of these. Watch out. That's COVID-19 in a pill. <laughs> the bottom of your... I'm sure it's something good. I think it's... I mean, that was basically the vaccine you just took. No, that was definitely something, like a vitamin. Curious. I'm sure I needed it. This is it. the smartest thing you have, and I want to know, why do you carry Benadryl? Benadryl, that's... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> do you have, like, an allergy? I. You, you never know when you're going to need Benadryl. I'm sorry that I'm just prepared for literally anything. Here's your pass for when you are on Kelly Clarkson on January 24th. It's July 19th. <laughs> Guys, it's July 19th. This is January 24th. Winnie does not have her shit together. She's a faker. <laughs> she's, she's, her purse is disgusting. I'm a secret mess. I'm <laughs> secretly a fucking mess. This is like when you're not supposed to meet your idols. It's just like, oh, like. This is who you really are? You're just like me. Ah! Their stars are just like us. Disgusting. Oh, my God. Thank you for letting me do... That is, is, by the way, the fact that that's my cosmetics bag is already... I, when I pulled this out, I was like, oh, that must be your makeup bag. But then there was a whole other pocket in here filled with makeup. So I'm like, oh, well, this is not her makeup bag. Bitch, this is your makeup bag. <laughs> you have... Hold on. One, two, three, I literally four, have more makeup in my bag than a clown would travel. Five, six, seven, eight, 
And there was another one, nine somewhere. <laughs> Wait, you yeah, this one. Nine. And I have two of the same one, by the way. Yeah, no, I know. These so are we two have of the two same of these. In one purse. <laughs> Nine, <laughs> ten, eleven. Oh my god, you have Lady Gaga makeup. Oh yeah. Twelve. What am I? You have twelve lip products in your purse. <laughs> That's more than anyone needs for a for a in a mansion. And you have them in your purse. I never know what direction I'm gonna want to go in. God, that is so crazy. You know. <laughs> is this if you see a child? That's really not appropriate. That's an a god. Oh, uh oh. What's that? I'm not going to reveal what that is. Let me see. Know. Beta blockers? Ooh, I've been looking for these. Yeah, propanolol, beta blockers. Ooh. Yeah, these are great. I'll take some of those home. Ooh, I love that. This is a, a sunscreen, Neutrogena shimmery sunscreen lip balm. Look. Isn't it crazy that you can have 40 lip balms in your purse, but you know you literally need every single one of them it's for a so different weird. reason? It's so weird. I have 12 lip glosses in here and I none of them can be removed from that bag how I is, need all of them how is the gaga lip gloss which one let me see house laboratories I think it's good I have some I can give you some extra it's a pretty color yeah I like the gaga lip glosses they're good well you guys it's true Whitney Cummings is just like the rest of us <laughs> her purse is disgusting she's a hoarder the, yeah She's a hoarder, but she loves her lip. She loves her lip products. Which you've really given me, me a lot like to you. think about. There, I think so. I feel like you've really held up a mirror. To me. <laughs> I think and so. And I don't appreciate it. And I fully plan on cutting this entire <laughs> chunk. Good. From the podcast. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm holding up for those of you listening and not watching a hot for my name. What is this? A latte? It, okay, so. This is the cutest thing ever. I am obsessed with lattes. Hot for I'm my name. Basic the name of and normal. Yeah. It's called the iced hot for my name. It's half oat milk, half coconut milk, a little bit of a Mary and Mary oh. shrub. And that oh has four God. shots of espresso. So good. It's, don't drink the whole thing. You drink four shots of espresso? No, 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 I do half of that. So it's this coffee shop in LA called Dayglow Coffee. I'm not making money off this. It was just like a promotional fun idea. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if people want to go to Dayglow Coffee Shop in this LA. This is so It's so cute. good. I also love this bottle. I'm going to keep reusing this bottle. It's so cute. To I hydrate know. myself. This is the thing. I'm becoming normal. I'm like into coffee now. Like that's my whole personality now is coffee and tie-dye. <laughs> I'm, I'm normal. <laughs> Um, that's everyone outside of LA is like, uh, uh, <laughs> what? What did that? What, what the fuck what is this? What did she say? Esther Club is Esther's podcast. Yes. I listened to a lot of your podcasts, uh, your last episode. There was something very soothing about how the first 20 minutes are just announcements. <laughs> 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 it was just sort of like logistics, you know, it's a lot of logistics said in a very charming <laughs> way. It's a lot of like apologizing for how she's saying something. It's like, it's kind of fun to just hear her say something just very simple and then completely unravel about <laughs> the way she said it. And then she's like, Try, she's like fixing her hair and makeup, like spiraling. <laughs> like she's just just it, what you'd expect. It's really just like a, a being inside her mind, <laughs> uh, and it actually was a fun journey. It was like going through a haunted house. Um, and but there's something really soothing about it because when I do announcements on this podcast, I'm so full of shame that I do it like really fast. And I'm just like like subscribe and, and rate our podcast <laughs> and do the comments. Like I'm I. <laughs> There is something really hypnotic about it. She was just like, you can text me at my new community number, you yes, guys. Thank you for What's helping. the number? Do you have it? Yes, I Oh god, do So I? this is the texting it? app that I do. You guys text me, I text you back. I send you birthday messages every day if it's your birthday. 818 till I die. 818-239-7527. You guys can text me and you actually explained how you have to log in and put in your birthday and where you live so that we can target our show. That? You did. Uh, our shows to you for when we come back on tour. So if I'm going to Orlando, I don't have to blast the whole world my Orlando date. I can just text Orlando people specifically. And by the way, sorry, Salt Lake City, Alabama, Arizona and San Diego, thank you for letting me text you directly. You guys are why I decided to reschedule the show because a lot of you guys were like, wow, I live with my grandma. I have an autoimmune thing. Can you, you know, I texted with people directly in those cities to tell me if I should keep the show or reschedule. That's, that's, bad. yeah, it was really helpful. Yeah. My number is 847 648 9098. And I am obsessed with this because I like, 
the same thing is happening was happening to me that happens to all comedians. It's like you're leaving Seattle and everyone's like, where are you coming to Seattle? And I'm like, I just fucking and then I get you, mad at yeah. them and they're mad at me. But it's yeah. like no one's fault that the Instagram algorithm didn't like me this week. Like, <laughs> so this is like if you're interested in updates, because for those of you that don't know Instagram and please correct me. Uh, the men in the room that generally probably know more than me about technology. Uh, and that's how I'd like to keep it. Um, I'm a Luddite by choice. It's the Instagram algorithm. In order to get an algorithm, the main feed, you have to get a certain amount of likes and comments in the first like minute, right? I think like there's something. It's called the patriarchy. Just kidding. The post velocity. Whoa, the torque. What? So if you don't get a certain amount of likes and comments, like in the first minute, like most people will not see your post at all. So this is a way that we can just directly text you. I picked 818 because of our friend Brody. Smart. I picked uh, 847 because I wish I still lived in Illinois. Um, I feel like you and I did have another level of bonding at Brody's Memorial. Yeah, you were the worst one there. <laughs> you were, because you had been totally chill. Like you were like, okay, we'll get through this. Like you were like very calm. Our friend and Brody then, Stevens, Google him. Um, he, you at the memorial were the in the biggest mess of anyone, and I think it's because you, I assume, like your coping before that was to just kind of be like everything's fine, everything's fine, and then you crashed. This is a friend there. of ours who passed. I was in denial for yeah the first week. I just like it didn't happen. Yeah, like I just was like like everyone. I my thing is like take care of everybody else. And then as soon as the memorial happened, I just broke. You were like, oh, no, it, this is real. Like As soon as Zach Galifianakis came out and was, like, giving a eulogy, it hit me. Yeah. Because you're like, Zach Galifianakis is at the comedy store? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something really bad <laughs> must, must have, have happened. happened. Oh, this is bad. It's so true. And it, like, hit me. And I could not hold it together. I yeah. could not function. That is the worst thing about this business is like getting close to people who are hurting mm. and having to, yeah, I don't know. What yeah. To say. Yeah. I don't know what to say. That was a I wild don't time. Say anything, that but. was a wild, wild time. Um, eight, one, eight till I die. Google it. Um, the guy that I am dating, uh, when I'm dating someone, I'll show them Brody's stand up, And if they laugh, we can keep dating. <laughs> And if they get confused, we stop. Like that's how, that's truly how I decide if I will go on a second date with a man. If they get Brody Stevens, we can move forward. And if they don't, if they're like, wait, is this, I don't know, why did he just, <laughs> why is he saying zip codes? Like if they don't get it, like I just, they're, we're done here. Like there's nothing else to say. Um, so uh, yeah, the guy that I'm dating um, loved it so much and is always like leather exterior. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's always like in my head. It's funny you say that because on my first date with Dave, he had known Brody because Brody did audience warm up on oh, yeah. a show that. Dave wrote for mm -hmm. and so Brody was like our one Hollywood connection that we both knew of and it just like put I just will never forget like the light it put on my face feeling like oh my god he knows Brody so I yes are you planning the wedding or no no do you know where you want to get married no I don't want a wedding I just really yeah I, I we've talked about this before too like I I don't know maybe one day mm -hmm. I now I have the pandemic to lean back on yeah 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 I just wanted the engagement i don't want to break up, but yeah. I also don't want a wedding. So. Interesting. Yeah. So Interesting. we'll see. Okay. I feel like I've talked so much and I'm sorry. And I feel like I need to, we need to release everyone. I'm going to stop talking and just let her go into a complete spiral. <laughs> this is what comedians do after they completely nail something <laughs> and are awesome at something. They just start to spiral into shame and think that they're like uh, putting people out. They just start <laughs> apologizing for doing a great job this on and feel safe just gonna go hide feel my put in my your face. good for you merch <laughs> benton's not here to say all this but don't ride elephants <laughs> like subscribe i'm very excited to use my new puke green eyeliner <laughs> that esther brought me what is it called the whitney challenge the whitney hashtag the hashtag whitney the whitney challenge. challenge how ugly can you get with makeup <laughs> I, that sounds meaner than I mean it to. So we are going to now experiment. Um, hashtag Whitney Challenge. Put on the ugliest color eyeliner you possibly can and tag us. Um, watch Hot For My Name on the Comedy Central app. And then it will be streaming. 
I really want to get this right. I hate it when I fucking go on podcast to promote something and then they're like, anyway, and they don't actually <laughs> promote the project. And I'm like, why the fuck? You're did I just... so nice. So I want to get it right. It it So Hot For My Name, the special on Comedy Central, there's clips on YouTube if you want to just do that. But there's uh, the full thing is on the Comedy Central app. You can access it with a YouTube TV or a Comedy Central login. I feel like I work for Viacom. I should get extra <laughs> money for saying all this. A lot of logistics. Jesus. Or after August 2nd, it's going to be streaming. You do have to take a quiz. <laughs> they will send you a code to your phone. This is my style. It has to be hard to find. <laughs> That's how, when you watch it, I know you're there because you, you want it. You have to be Liam Neeson and Taken <laughs> in order to figure so out how the fuck to watch It's degrading this. how much I have to say. I know. But you know what? They let us do what we wanted, yeah. and I'm happy with how it turned out. And you guys don't have anything to do, and you run out of things to watch. So you can put in a couple fucking passwords. Um, on Hulu, watch Dollface um, and Alone Together. Yeah. And you're on, uh, what else? You're on a bunch of shit. No. My Crazy right. Ex-Girlfriend, you're on crazy some episodes of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So just like works. binge Esther this weekend. You guys. Um, anything else and to like say? and subscribe to Whitney. Oh, and the Esther Club podcast and the oh. makeup glowing up. Which you're going to be on. Yes. I'm now promoting that episode. <laughs> I'm going to be on it soon, so tune in. All right, I love you guys. I end these very Thank awkwardly. <laughs> please, please don't ride elephants. Love you. Can I repeat? Oh, my God.